meeting of the subcommittee will come to order. Today's hearing is on the reauthorization of the Federal Family Planning Program, also known as Title X of the Public Health Service Act. Along with Congressman Madigan, I've introduced legislation to extend that program for three years. As anyone who reads a newspaper or a law review knows, this program has been attacked from almost the first moment of the present administration, overlooking the medical, public health, and health care benefits of contraception the administration has sought to defund the program, harass its providers and patients, relocate its services, and revise the basic statute by regulation. In Congress, in the courts, and in the clinics, none of these efforts has succeeded, and none of them has diminished the widespread public and political support that exists throughout the nation for the family planning program. Americans of all stripe, Republican and Democrat, liberal and conservative, anti-abortion and pro-choice support Title X. They recognize that it promotes maternal and child health and family stability. They recognize that for every dollar invested in family planning, we save three dollars in health care costs. They recognize that with adequate counseling and contraception, the need for abortion services is diminished. There has been confusion, both inside and outside the administration. Efforts have been made to make Title X a litmus test for abortion politics. These efforts are mistaken and misguided, and ultimately have fooled very few people only for only a short time. I know that these efforts are ongoing, but this year I hope that the Congress will recognize that Title X and family planning services in general are solid health care. Along with childhood immunizations, family planning is probably the most direct and effective method we have for preventing illness and for limiting health care costs. I hope that today's hearings will uh, demonstrate this effectiveness and lead to the reauthorization of this successful, successful program. I'd like to ask unanimous, unanimous consent that the Waxman Madigan Bill, H.R. 3769, be made part of the record at this point. Before recognizing and calling on our witnesses, I'd like to uh, call upon a very distinguished member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, Congressman Nielsen from the state of Utah, for comments that he may wish to make. Thank you. Uh, I'm not a member of this subcommittee, was for two terms, but I'm not present, but I am a member of the full committee, and I appreciate the chairman, Mr. Waxman, allowing me to sit on the panel. I have a real interest in this particular title, Title 10 and Title 20. At one time, we kind of made a little agreement. We won't mess with Title 10 if he wouldn't mess with Title 20. I think that's, I don't know if that's formal that was or not, but we do have some interest in the area. I have a witness who will be speaking on the third panel, Dr. Stan Weed, who's done a lot of work on uh, teenage pregnancy, and I'll be introducing him at that time. I just appreciate uh, the chairman's willingness to let me sit on the panel. I hope I can be helpful. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Nielsen. We're, uh, we're pleased to have with us, representing the administration, the uh, Assistant Secretary for Health, the Department of Health and Human Services, Dr. Robert E. Windham. Dr. Windham, we want to rec uh, welcome you to our subcommittee hearing this morning. Uh, we have your prepared statement. We'll make it part of the record in full. We'd like you to uh, summarize or make your oral presentation to us in around five minutes so we'll have full opportunity for questions and answers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Nielsen. I am pleased to be here with you today to discuss Title X of the Public Health Service Act, the Family Planning Program. Accompanying me is Ms. Public Health Service Act, the Family Planning Program. Accompanying me is Ms. Neighbors Cabanus, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Population Affairs, who is directly responsible for administering the program, and Mr. Ronald Robinson, Robertson, the General Counsel for the Department of Health and Human Services. Family planning services are an integral component of primary health care and are well established in most states. The Department strongly supports authorization of the Title X Family Planning Program as a state administered grant program and will soon submit legislation to bring this change about. Making the states the sole family planning grantees will enable them to exercise maximum flexibility in tailoring services to best meet their citizens' needs. States and territorial health departments are the sole grantees 
<coughs> in 33 states and territories. And in another 11 states, they are one of the grantees funded by the program. Passage of our proposal would allow states to administer the family planning program in all jurisdictions with the flexibility to operate clinics through county agencies, private agencies, or hospitals, as is most appropriate for each particular state. In my testimony today, I would like to discuss the current categorical family planning program under Title X of the Public Health Service Act, provide more detail on our proposal to transfer the administration of the program to the states, and discuss several key activities and priorities of the program under its current form. The current Title X family planning statute authorizes four components, family planning services, research, training, and information and education. In FY88, 130 million was provided to support family planning services. In addition to the services funds, estimated funding for the three other major program areas is 1.4 million to support the research program designed to improve the, the delivery of family planning services. 3.4 million to provide training for family planning personnel and 400,000 to fund information and education activities. Family planning services. Title X was enacted in 1970 as a national program to assist in making family planning services readily available to all persons desiring such services. Family planning projects are required to provide a broad range of acceptable and effective methods of contraception and various other services related to reproductive health care. Acceptance of family planning services must be voluntary. Since the enactment of Title X, requirements have been added that natural family planning, infertility services, services for adolescents, and family involvement must be a part of Title X projects. In accordance with the statute, programs funded by Title X must assure that priority is given to persons from low-income families. Title X contains an explicit prohibition on use of funds appropriated under this title in programs where abortion is a method of family planning. Recently, the department promulgated new regulations to ensure grantee compliance with this prohibition. To support the delivery of family planning services, grants are awarded to public and private nonprofit entities to establish and operate voluntary family planning projects. These grants are awarded and monitored by the Public Health Service regional offices. In FY87, $136 million was spent to fund 89 grantees that provided services at over 4,000 clinic sites to an estimated 4.3 million persons, about one-third of whom were adolescents. In FY88, as a result of the bipartisan budget agreement to reduce the deficit, $130 million has been made available to approximately the same number of grantees and clinics to support the services. In addition to the FY88 funds provided to each regional office in accordance with the allocation, $478,000 has been provided to each region to support national priorities projects in the areas of infertility services, family involvement, male involvement, adolescent abstinence, prevention of sexually transmitted diseases, and regionally determined areas of concern. For service delivery improvement, the focus of the service delivery improvement research program continues to be the enhancement of the delivery system, particularly at the clinic level. Six service delivery improvement projects are currently funded, including projects to study the effects of integrating family planning services with other services, the factors influence, influencing contraceptive behavior among adolescent clients and ways in which clinics can attract more male clients. Other program activities. Title X programs are designed to provide personnel with skills and knowledge necessary for the effective delivery of family planning services. Training is currently provided through 10 regional general training grants and five nurse practitioner training grants. These grants provide training for personnel at all levels of service delivery, including medical and professional staff, administrators, and technical and clerical staff. In FY88, each of the training grantees was awarded supplemental funds to provide training on the prevention of AIDS. 1989 State Administered Family Planning Program Proposal. We will very shortly be submitting legislation to establish Title X as a family planning grant pro program fully administered by the states. Shifting the administration of the family planning grant program to the states will enable them to exercise maximum flexibility in tailoring services to more appropriately and effectively meet their citizens' family planning needs. Within this framework, certain federal requirements would be retained, including prohibition on funding programs where abortion is a method of family planning. The proposed program of state administered grants would have many advantages over the present grant program. It would result in improved allocation of resources, 
improve services delivery, and greater administrative flexibility. This proposal will allow states to plan family planning programs in conjunction with other state administered health programs. Service delivery and program administration would be improved by elimination of a burdensome application reporting and monitoring requirements. As you know, February 2, the Department of Health and Human Services issued final regulations to clarify and enforce statutory prohibition on the use of funds in programs where abortion is a method of family planning. Implementation of these regulations has been enjoined by court action in Boston, Denver, and New York. So pending clarification of the scope of the permanent injunction in Boston, our regional offices have been instructed to refrain, refrain from implementing the final rules. AIDS efforts, although efforts to prevent HIV infection, have generally focused on homosexual and drug abuse populations. We must not overlook the critical role of the family planning program to prevent heterosexual and perinatal transmission. Last year, the Office of PA Population Affairs issued program guidance which requires all of our family planning clinics to offer education and information programs to our clinical personnel. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, the Title X family planning program plays a very important role in the health care system by providing a needed service to over 4 million persons, primarily low-income women, each year. We believe our proposal to shift the administration of this program to the states will provide states with a necessity, with the necessary authority and flexibility to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the program. This action will increase the program's ability to meet the health care needs of our citizens and improve the delivery of high quality, free or low cost family planning services to the people who need these services. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. I'm sorry to be a few minutes over. That's fine. Thank you very much, Dr. Wyndham, for your <coughs> testimony. In uh, 1984, <coughs> Secretary Heckler testified before this committee that the Inspector General of HHS had determined that, quote, the prohibition against abortion was well known at the level of the family planning clinics and it was being honored, end quote. She went on to say that the family planning clinics have been very aware and have honored the law in terms of the abortion prohibition, which was the main subject of the GAO report. In 1985, the last time this committee held hearings on the Title X program, Dr. James Mason, who was then in your job, testified on behalf of the administration. I asked Dr. Mason at that time if he agreed with the 1984 statements made by Secretary Heckler. He responded, yes, I agree with the Secretary. In his confirmation uh, testimony, Secretary Bowen said that he saw no reason to change Secretary Heckler's assessment. My first question to you, Dr. Wyndham, is simply this. Do you agree with Secretary Heckler, Dr. Mason, and Secretary Bowen? Now, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to clarify the uh, answer to that question by what Ms. Cabinets will respond to, because it's in the testimony. I'd like for her to... No, I'm asking you the question. They testified that the prohibition against abortion was well known at the level of the family planning clinics, and it was being honored. And you're now testifying on behalf of the administration. Do you agree with Secretary Heckler? and Secretary Bowen and Dr. Mason. Well, I think from what our te her testimony sh uh, showed from Ms. Heckler at that time that there was some confusion on her part about that, and it was not clear as to what was really uh, the intention of her statement. And that's what I wanted to refer to in this. Uh, well, let me ask you about the present sta status. Do you believe at the present time that the family planning clinics are aware of the prohibition against abortion and that they're honoring the law uh, prohibiting the family planning clinics from engaging in abortion. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm asking uh, Dr. Wyndham that question. Yes. Well, they are honoring what is currently believed to be the direction that they're to follow. However, I believe there's some misunderstanding that uh, is there that uh, creates the, the problem. What is that misunderstanding? Well, may I refer to this testimony that, was, that you were referring to also and read it? When that question was uh, asked Ms. Heckler, she said, I certainly do not. I have always known the difference. Obviously, in a statute prohibits abortion advice, counseling, or involvement. I will say that I think Marjorie Mecklenburg was appointed and works under Dr. Brandt, uh, who is at my left, and very able assistant. 
and says that unfortunately the whole area of population affairs and family planning throughout history, we tend to have been, we've seen almost a political seesaw between people on one side of the issue or the other. And that's where there is. Whose testimony is this that you're reading? Uh, Ms. Heckler's testimony that was, okay. you're referring to her statement back in 19. Well, she told us at that time she saw no reason to change the law. And Dr. Bowen indicated to us he saw no reason to change the law. If you're reading that they had some confusion in their minds about what was going on, I'm asking you, since you're in charge of the running the department as it relates to Department of Health and Human Services, as it relates to health issues, we have the law that says that family planning clinics are not to be engaging in abortion services. And I want to know to you, from you whether you think that the family planning clinics are aware of this prohibition against abortion services and are honoring the law that re requires them to refrain from those services. Well, that is why I would say, sir, that at this point we feel there is confusion in the area, and that's why we have promulgated these new regulations to clarify that so that to your answer directly, there does not exist in all these clinic sites that clear understanding of the law and where this is a site of confusion we feel that the law needs to be, the regulations need to be more specific. Well, GAO, GAO the Government Accounting Office said, what was it, already uh, 1982, that's six years ago, that they found in their evaluation that the family planning clinics were very much aware and were honoring the law in terms of the abortion prohibition. Now, you feel that Either there wasn't, uh, that wasn't correct, that they're not uh, honoring the law, or two, that you don't think that it's clear that there is a prohibition against abortion services. Which, which is it? Well, I think that the law from GSA, GAO, rather, report indicated that, the, that we need to clarify the scope of the law, and that's why we are following that direction to make it more specific and clear, because there was existing some confusion at that time, too. And their report asked us, as the department, to clarify the entire scope of that. Okay, well, under the authority of the department, by regulations, you've sought to change the law, and three courts have said that's illegal. I want to now ask you this. What evidence do you have that indicates that the family planning clinics either were unaware that the law prohibited them from doing abortion services, either unaware of it, or were not following the law? I think the clarity of the fact that the people in the clinics understood they could not perform abortions, they still were not clear of the entire scope of what was allowed for them to do in regard to the, the abortion issue, and that's why we're trying to clarify that to make it clear for all to understand. Was it, wasn't it the case that prior to the change in the regulations that prohibited abortion counseling, that the regulations, in fact, instructed the family clinic clinics that they had to do abortion counseling. Well, the regulation there before did say that the counseling for abortion was to be allowed. I'm sorry. Yeah, the counseling for abortion was to be one of the components. Right. Of so prior to your change in the regulations, the regulations said that they had to do abortion counseling. These were the guidelines that included right. that as one so of the... you didn't clarify anything. You reversed it, didn't you? You reversed well, it and said now they can't do abortion counseling because before they could, and then you told them now you can't. The guideline before allowed that to be performed. It required counseling. it to be performed, didn't it? I believe it was... I think that was only since 1981, that's when that was required. It was required as one of the non-directive abortion, right. non-directive pregnant, uh, pregnancy counseling matters and to discuss uh, abortion as one of the options. But, but it required by the regulations prior to right. the change of administration policy. And in fact, in reviewing those regulations and those guidelines, 
we felt that this particular aspect of the abortion counseling, which was provided there, was inappropriate for the overall scope of the total uh, Title X regulation. Well, that's not a confusion about what the law was. That's a change in interpretation of the law. It's a reversal of policy, isn't it? Yeah. Well, this is just one of the aspects of the overall regulations. Uh, others involve uh, counseling for uh, adoption. Uh, another, but in uh, this particular instance is what I'm discussing, yes. the abortion question, right. whether that can be discussed as an option. There's been a reversal of position by the administration, not a clarification of some ambiguity. Let me, uh, let me go on and ask you uh, further about this. The, as you well know, the department adopted these reg new regulations and three different federal district court judges have enjoined the department's February 1988 regulations. Indeed, in the Boston case, Judge Walter Skinner issued a permanent injunction. In so doing, Judge Skinner stated that he assumed that the secretary, as a responsible public official, will apply this judicial determination even-handedly to all similarly situated entities in the United States. Despite this, just three weeks ago, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Population Affairs, Neighbors Cabanas, sitting right next to you, filed papers with the District Court for the Southern District of New York in which she declared her intention to implement the federal regulations against any Title X grantee not covered by an injunction. Would you address the apparent discrepancy between Judge Skinner's opinion and Ms. Cabanas's action? And do I have assurance that the Department will not seek to implement the Feb February regulations against any agency that is not covered by any of the three injunctions while the case is on appeal? Mr. Chairman, I feel it would be most appropriate if Ms. Cabin has responded to that, if I may. Fine. Uh, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> we stated in the court in New York that we would intend to issue the and implement the regulations where not enjoined, if not impractical. Um, we have not yet received clarification on the full scope of the injunction in Boston. Uh, one of the plaintiffs, NIFRA, has supplied their membership list to us. Um, one of the other plaintiffs, the American Public Health Association, has not yet done that. So pending clarification of the scope of the injunction, we will not implement the regs and we have so instructed our regional offices. So if you find that there's a family planning clinic not covered by a specific injunction because they weren't actually a party to the lawsuit, would you plan to then go ahead and implement the regulations as, a, as to that uh, family planning clinic? If there were only one clinic out of 4,000 across the country, clearly we would not. We would have to make a determination about how many grantees and how many uh, clinics are <laughs> not covered by the injunction and make a determination. But until we know the full scope of that ruling, we can't make such a judgment. Well, you're saying as to one clinic, there are thousands of clinics around the country that there are, are not 4, part. There are 4,000. Okay, uh, and I don't know how many were parties to the lawsuit. Do you feel you have the, the legal authority to go ahead and implement the regulations to any of these other clinics? No, one, 500, 1,000, just because they're not named as a party to the lawsuit? Well, again, we would have to make that determination uh, and perhaps Mr. Robertson could respond to that, but we will make that determination when we have information on what the scope of the injunction is. Mr. Robertson, you're the general counsel for the Department of Hum Health and Human Services. There's an injunction that's been uh, promulgated against the department from enforcing the regulations. Do you think that uh, the regulations can be enforced against other parties, other, other uh, grantees that, are, that were not simply because they weren't parties to the action? Mr. Chairman, we're very much aware of the uh, judge's words in that order um, and have conferred with the Department of Justice on this issue and have been advised by the Department of Justice, who is of course representing the department in the uh, pending litigation, uh, that um, indeed the department could proceed with partial implementation in those areas that uh, would not be specifically covered by the scope of any of the, of the existing injunction. Now, you say the scope. What does that mean? If the department, if the judge comes in and says what the department's done by regulation is not consistent with the law, 
and you have no authority to issue such regulations. Would that permit you to go ahead and enforce those regulations against other grantees who are not part simply because they weren't parties to the action? That's that's what we've been advised by the Department of Justice. Isn't that that under the um, order by the court in Boston that uh, partial implementation could proceed once we have determined the specific scope of that uh, order. In other words, determined which grantees are encompassed under that order, that grantees not specifically covered under that order, or the uh, orders from the court in New York. What is the purpose to be served? Is it simply to require that every grantee have to file another separate legal action in every district court in this country, wasting money and time for both sides, taxpayers to defend those lawsuits, Justice Department to go in and bring them? Uh, what, what purpose can possibly be served if you've been told by a judge you don't have the authority to have the issue these regulations. Why can't you wait until there's a final determination before you go and force other people to get the same same injunction? Well, the issue I has been litigated and injunction has been granted. Shouldn't that stand as a precedent for other cases? Well, I would view that as a as a program, a policy determination. I was addressing uh, what I understood your specific question with res with respect to the legal analysis as to the uh, scope of the uh, injunction from the court in Boston. So it's a policy determination. And let me ask Dr. Wyndham, since you're in charge of the policy, why would you want to require every grantee around the country to have to use uh, their funds and go hire lawyers and go into court and make the same case for an injunction? What policy purpose can be served by trying to enforce the regulations against some grantees simply because they weren't named as the original parties of the lawsuit. Uh, let, let me, if I may, respond to that. First of all, we, we do not know yet the scope of the injunction. Therefore, we do not know whether we will implement it on some grantees and not on others. But um, very if clearly... The scope, if the scope of the injunction is such that it says you don't have the authority to issue the regulations, clearly wouldn't that scope mean that you don't have authority to enforce them against any grantee? Clearly, we will abide by what the courts tell us to do. But if the courts are not um, speaking for all grantees across the country, our um, intent and our purpose is to very clearly separate abortion from family planning. That is the mission of the uh, regulations. We believe it is consistent with the statute. We believe it is consistent with the legislative you, history. I know you believe that, but the courts where it has been litigated didn't agree with you. The court said, you don't have the authority to issue these regulations. Now you're saying, however, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you then have the authority to say, unless this particular grantee is, is, a, is, is, is involved in that specific piece of litigation, I'm going to go ahead and try to enforce the regulations on them and make them have to go to court to file to get an injunction in their particular case. How can you justify If, if one doing particular that? judge does not speak for the whole nation, as I understand has been the case in um, the opinions that have been issued so far, then uh, clearly we don't interpret him as speaking for the whole nation. We will abide by Is what the Is that a policy says. decision or a legal decision? The law tells us we do not have to implement, we're not, excuse me, we can implement, we're not enjoined. We will have to make a policy decision with regards to where is that practical and is it practical? Well. Dr. Uh, Wyndham, your people have declined to answer staff questions about these regulations because you were in litigation. Now, it seems to me that you have a choice here. You can agree that your regulations are in litigation for all grantees, or you can disagree and say that the regulations are in place for some grantees. And as I understand, we're being told that regulations are in effect for some grantees. If you say that they're in force, then I believe you must answer all my questions about them. It, it is inconceivable to me that you believe that there can be executive branch activities for which you're not accountable to either the Congress or the courts. I'm going to ask you again, will you, uh, if you, if you are not going to commit that these regulations will not be enforced against any grantee or potential grantee while the litigation is ongoing, if you're not going to make that commitment, and I gather that's the testimony of, uh, of your assistant, uh, Ms. Cabanis, I want, to, I want uh, to have you fully cooperate in answering I will. our questions about, uh, about these regulations. 
Mr. Chairman, uh, we do not have the information yet to know what numbers we're speaking of as far as a total 4,000 plus clinics that we have to know the scope of the involvement of the uh, injunction right now or the legal effect on how many. If it turns out it is a great majority, a high number that that does enjoin, then uh, we would certainly consider waiting to see uh, the reaction to that. Well, if, if you're prepared to, to enforce so these regulations against any grantees, it seems to me you should be prepared also to answer our questions. We're not, are, you, are you prepared to answer our questions yes, about these regulations? We're not enforcing any of those regulations against any grantee at this time. You're have, not at the present time? No, we have not implemented the new regulations at this time okay, well, on any grantee. Then, then <coughs> my statement to you is that if you start enforcing those regulations, we are going to expect that you'll have to come before us and answer all the policy questions about mm -hmm. those regulations, which heretofore the department has refused because the claim is that you're in litigation. Yes, that's our legal counsel guidance at uh, well, that's, this time. That we will expect, we will accept, mm -hmm. so as long as you're not going forward with those regulations. But if you go forward with those regulations and you're going ahead and implementing them as to some grantees, then you've got to answer the Congress about those regulations, because those regulations are in effect, and, it's, and as to them, yes. there is no litigation. Yes. I have other questions, but I want to give Mr. Nielsen an opportunity to pursue some of his, and then we'll go back to another round. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I have a number of questions which have been submitted by Mr. Bliley. I wonder if they could be submitted to the witness uh, directly. Uh, written questions? It, yes, from Mr. Yeah, Bliley. Without objection, we will submit <coughs> these written questions uh, to, the, to the department and ask that you respond in writing. Right. Thank you. In 1982, a GAO report that the chairman has referred to was issued about the abortion prohibition in Title 10, how it was working. And uh, in addition to Section 1008, which specifically uh, prohibits the use of funds for abortion, are there any other regulations or any other statements or any other things that you deal with this issue that keep uh, the state that the pre about the language about the uh, program being free from abortion. Mr. Nielsen, uh, since Ms. Cabin is, does direct that program, she can give you more specific answers. Uh, uh, in addition to Section 1008. Yes, in addition to Section 108, there um, is substantive legislative history that uh, makes it clear that the family planning program was in no way intended to be involved in abortion activities. Um, indeed, Congressman Dingell, in introducing uh, 108, made one statement that if there's any direct relationship between family planning and abortion, it would be this, that properly operated family planning programs should reduce the incidence of abortion. And he went on to say that um, abortion should not be encouraged or promoted in any way in the Title X family planning program. You've been criticized as a department for paying too much attention to the abortion side of Title X. Uh, with all due respects, it may be that you've concerned yourself too little with that aspect. It's because it's taken you five years to look at the regulations and to uh, perhaps adopt the GAO re uh, recommendation 1982. Would you respond to that, please? Again. Um, we share the concerns with the time that it has taken to really take substantive action to deal with um, the connection between abortion and family planning, and we're just pleased that action fi that we have finally taken action to um, get abortion out of Title X. Now let me get to the reason, first question that I really have, and that is, you apparently object to the H.R. 3769, the, uh, the Waxman-Madigan bill, which is to reauthorize Title X, with substantially no changes, you object to it. Would you detail the reasons for your objections, or what your objections are? And also, while you're at it, uh, do you also have the same objections or different objections to Senate 1366? If I may answer that question, um, the two bills are very similar. We have an official position on S-1366. We have not um, filed a bill report on the House bill. Um, well, our, tell me what your objections to 1366 Okay, our, our concerns are really um, threefold. The primary concern is the administration supports a state-administered family planning program. Um, the bill before the House is not a state-administered family planning program. It would continue the program as is. So our primary concern is that it is inconsistent with the major reform in the program which we would like to make. Now, was um, that recommended in the GAO report that it be state-administered? Uh, that was not a part of the GAO report. No, sir. 
Um, our further objections uh, relate to the expanded authorities for contraceptive research and the expanded authorities for community-based information and education. We don't believe those authorities are necessary in the family planning program. We believe uh, sufficient authorities exist for those activities. Where? Um, in, in Title X itself. And I could get you those particular sections. Um, and our final concern is that it is beyond the budget um, request for this administration. So basically, you want, it does not steal state administered as you, you prefer. Uh, it expands the powers beyond what you think it should have. And three, it costs too much. Is that Correct. basically it? OK. Now, are any Title X funds used to support school-based clinics that provide contraceptives to teenagers? In your knowledge? There are a variety of uh, different definitions of what a school-based clinic is. Um, based on an informal survey of our grantees, we have... Do you provide funds to any of those school-age teenage clinics? We do not appear to be funding direct contraceptive services in schools. We may be providing services relating to the contraceptive distribution, such as prescriptions, family planning, counseling. We do not appear at this time to be actually involved in distributing contraceptives in schools. Dr. Wyndham, would you... Uh Tell me what parental involvement there is in the Title X program. Well, we certainly <coughs> we encourage uh, parental involvement, but by statute, uh, we, it is not directed. And we uh, see that this does vary from uh, clinic site to clinic site, but wherever possible, uh, this is an encouraged uh, issue, and we try to have the uh, teenager involved uh, with the uh, problem to uh, certainly uh, talk with and share that with the parent. But we cannot obligate that. Uh, in statute. my native state of Utah, uh, we have what some people call the squeal law. And uh, our law requires parental consent. If a teenager receives, uh, um, if, he, if he's prescribed contraceptive drugs or devices paid for with, by federal funds, and the courts have held that federal funding under such a law is illegal, and therefore our uh, family planning funds have been revoked. Do you think that that is right? Do you think that we should have uh, had the funds revoked because we state has a so-called squeal law? Well, according to the law, I guess that would be in violation, and so I presume that would have to be the course to follow, but I don't think that would preclude the encouragement uh, of the parental. And just, just to add on to that, if I may, I think clearly the administration supports um, efforts to involve the family, indeed supports um, parental notification and parental consent. However, our regulations to accomplish that were uh, not upheld in court, and therefore in order to um, allow Utah to do that, separate legislative authority would be needed. But don't you think by cutting off the funds it denies the country the opportunity to see whether such a program would work or not? Um, we, would, we would concur in that and um, we would support legislative efforts to allow that sort of activity. What type of research do you do under Title X? You mentioned you didn't want to go, didn't want to expand the research powers of, in, as the uh, Waxman, Madigan bill would do. So what kind of research do you do currently? Our research is directed toward service delivery improvement. Um, we have funded a variety of research to help clinics better deliver services. That includes projects to promote male involvement in the delivery of family planning services, to promote better integration of services between family planning clinics and sexually transmitted disease clinics. Um, as well as research on natural family planning and a variety of uh, management issues in Title X. Are any funds from Title X used for sex education in the schools? Uh, yes, uh, I assume that it is used for sex education. Do you have any details about that? Uh, we would not have numbers on uh, exact could, amount. but Could you supply details? Uh, we can. Clearly there's no prohibition in the current law for that being done. Have you evaluated or reviewed the progress of those type particular programs? We have not. Would you do that? I think it would be very important for you to, to supply the information to how much extent, what funds are being used for sex education and what has been the effect of that, those funds, use of those funds. We would indeed like to have information on that, um, on the effectiveness of Title X. Gentlemen, yield to me. I'll be happy to yield. You want to find out how much of Title X funding is going into sex education. I wouldn't counseling a teenager about sexual activity and contraception 
and re personal responsibility be sex education? Yes, to some extent. I, I was talking about formal classroom presentation, however. Uh, I, I, you, so you want to limit your inquiry to formal classroom education about sex? I think his question was about what um, sex education do we do in schools? I, I just wonder how many of those sex education programs on a formal classroom type setup rather than individual counseling, which I understand the need for, uh, how much of that comes from Title X funds? I'd like to have that information to the extent you could provide it and also an evaluation of how effective it is. Uh, I re understand the, the comment the chairman has made there. I have other questions. Maybe perhaps you'd like another round, then I'd like to have a few more questions. Fine. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Wyndham, you just told Mr. Nielsen that parental involvement varies from clinic site to clinic site. Could you submit uh, studies for the record that indicate that parental involvement varies from clinic site to clinic site? Yes, uh, of course, the degree and the absolute amount and to what extent with each person, each counselor is involved uh, is often difficult. I think there's some degree of maybe more encouragement uh, by one counselor in one area compared well, to another. Well, I'm not talking about counselor by counselor, oh. clinic site by clinic site. That was your statement. Do you have any evidence? A variation in the degree of the commitment or that involvement. Uh, I don't know of any study. We haven't done any studies per se, but we just know that we hear in some areas that representatives in those clinics are more in the way of trying to get parental involvement with the teenagers. Others maybe not as aggressive, but there are no tangible specific. It's not clinic by clinic, but maybe on personal individual cases that some may be more involved in urging parental. And this has not been any study per se, sir. It's just based upon what we we're hearing in um, variation. If I may add to that, I think yes. the, the issue here is uh, there are no specific regulatory requirements for how family involvement is to be promoted. Therefore, um, there is not one standard for all 4,000 clinics, it is the clinics <coughs> make their own judgments I know there's about. No, I know there's no regulation that uh, sets out a specific requirement, but the, the law which I authored says that we want family involvement to be encouraged by the clinics. Dr. Wyndham's statement a minute ago was that the, the uh, spirit of the law is being lived up to in some clinics well and in other clinics not well varies from clinic site to clinic site. And as I understand now, that isn't really an accurate statement based on any studies, but uh, an observation that some counselors may be more uh, anxious to bring in the family than others. Right. Is that a correct statement? That's what we're saying, sir, yes. It's one of that clarification. Right. There seems to be some confusion about the reach of the Title X program now and about my bill to reauthorize it. Does the current family planning program require that grantees provide school-based clinics? No. No, it does not. Is there anything in the bill that encourages such clinics? Under current law, no. No, no anything in the legislation that uh, we've introduced that would encourage that? Well, we assume that that expanded provision was added for a particular reason um, and that you saw some need for an expanded authority to my knowledge, there is no explicit requirement in your bill to fund school-based clinics. Which expanded authority in the legislation are you referring the, to? The uh, community-based information and education services. But that's, uh, for contra that's not for contraceptive information, only for school-based clinics. Isn't that correct? Is that your understanding? It would be presumably for a variety of types of services that might be provided in school, sex education services, counseling services that might be provided. It does not, as I read it, um, apply to direct contraceptive distribution. Okay. Is there any reason to believe that the Department of Health and Human Services would change its current policies to start school-based contraceptive clinics if this bill became law? The position of the department is that we are very concerned with the mixed message that is sent um, to adolescents by the provision of contraceptives um, in schools and we would not support um, expanding in any way the role of the Title X program in offering such services at schools. So the bill does not provide for expanding contraceptive services in school-based clinics and you uh, 
at, at the department uh, don't want to do that, even though you may have some authority to do it. So therefore, whether this law is changed or not, as it relates to school-based clinics for other purposes, it wouldn't require you to provide contraceptive services at school-based clinics. We would not and read. And you would not be inclined to do so. That is correct. Okay. Do you have any reason to believe that the bill Mr. Madigan and I have introduced, H.R. 3769, um, will force HHS to fund abort, abortifacient development? Well, the Hyde Amendment um, prohibits funding of the performance of abortions. Um, one would assume that that would also cover um, any clinical trials in which abortifacient drugs were provided to pregnant women for purposes of um, inducing abortion. So under the Hyde Amendment, we would, ass uh, we would assume that we cannot fund abortifacient drugs, at least as it relates to directly providing the drug to pregnant women. Is there anything in the bill that Mr. Madigan and I have introduced that would change the policy in any way and require the department to, uh, uh, to deal with the development of abortifacient drugs? We would have to, I think, know a little bit more about what your intention is in um, expanding the authority. Presumably, you are not happy with the authority in the current legislation, and you have a reason for expanding that authority. How about your reading of the language of the bill? A reading of the language of the bill would not suggest that we would be required to fund abortifacient drugs. And indeed, the administration's policy is that we will not and do not fund research on drugs for abortifacient purposes. I'm a little confused about the desire of the administration to have the family planning program run exclusively by the states. Is that your desire? You want the states to run these programs and not go through clinics? Our proposal is that the states uh, run the programs and then they would delegate the delivery of services to um, clinics, hospitals, a uh, variety of types of organizations as is currently done. Now, under current law, a state can come in and ask to be recognized uh, for Title X purposes and in fact, the law even gives them priority should they come in and apply to take on this responsibility. Why, why would we want to do anything more? Evidently, some states don't want to take on this responsibility. Why would we try to force them to take on this responsibility? Our effort is to minimize the federal paperwork and the federal regulatory burden upon the states in delivering services and allow the states to operate family planning programs in accordance with local priorities and local standards. Therefore, we believe that handing it over to the states and allowing them to spend the money for family planning services in accordance with their local needs and priorities is a better and more efficient way to deliver family planning services. I have no problem if the states applied with good, solid applications for funding and having the states run the programs, but there are 17 who are not sole grantees. Uh, either they can't run or don't want to run a good program or feel that there are others better qualified to do so. Why should we at the federal government say that we're going to overturn a state decision not to come in and supersede the other grantees that they think are doing a pretty good job? I thought that, I thought the conservative Republican philosophy was to let these local governments make the decisions for themselves. Well, that's, that's exactly right, and we are concerned that really since its inception, the Title X program has been plagued by controversy. The controversies have primarily centered around abortion and around family and parental involvement in the program. Um, we, so do you want to buck all those controversies to the states and let the states have to fight? We would things? like to see diversity in the program so that states can administer the program in a way that meets local priorities and local values and standards. You're not saying that the only reason those 17 states have not gotten grants is because there's some federal prohibition against them coming in. and There is no assault. federal prohibition against any state coming in. So it, I would think the conclusion to be reached is that they don't want to do it. And uh, if we're going to say if they don't want to do it, either because they don't want to or they think it's already being done well, we're going to superimpose our judgment over theirs. 
I have other questions, uh, but I want to recognize Mr. Nielsen, then I'm going to ask him further questions after that. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I'd like to follow up on the question about uh, why you yeah. think that state, state programs would improve the program. In other words, having the administering through Title X through the states. How do you think that would improve the program? Well, Mr. Nielsen, you mentioned the situation in Utah in which you are not currently allowed to um, require the parents. That's, or get parental consent. Um, that's the sort of issue that we believe that the states can best address themselves. But isn't that part of Title XX? Of the, that is correct. In other words, parental consent is involved in the requirement of Title XX, but not of Title X. That's that correct. correct. Uh, have you analyzed the difference between Title X and Title XX, whether that involving the parents has really helped or has not? Well, indeed, we are finding in the Title XX program that um, family involvement um, is helping. Um, it's, um, it's definitely making a difference. If I could follow on to a previous question you asked about what evaluation has been done of sex ed programs in Title X, uh, one of the um, divergences between Title X and XX is that XX requires evaluation. XX is held to a very high standard of let's look at the effect of these programs on teen pregnancy and teen sexual activity. There has never been any mandate by Congress that Title X be held to a similarly high standard. Okay. Um, many, grant, many states are grantees in Title X program. How would your proposal differ from the current program? since many states are already involved with it. The for those states that are, let's put it this way, for those states which are already grantees under Title X, how would it differ from the, in those states? If the uh, state had particular priorities in the way of um, who should be served in the program, what types of services should be provided as a part of family planning, um, the degree of family involvement, those would be all issues that the state could decide. Would there be some administrative savings if the states took it over? Um, yes, there would be a reduction of about 40 FTEs at the federal level. If would that reduction provide for additional service at the federal level, or would it just be a savings, net savings? Uh, it would be a savings. Is one of the cases where we give the states the, uh, the program without the wherewithal? We would not be reducing fund. Uh, we would not be reducing dollars that would go to the states. That would continue at current levels. So the savings would be at the federal. Uh, level rather than <coughs> the state level should say about the same. Actually a little the, more would be going to the states. So they would get some benefit. Yes. In other words the administrative costs saved at the federal level would accrue to the benefits of the states. That's correct. Okay. <coughs> are you aware of any state initiatives which are currently ongoing that are making inroads in the problem of teenage pregnancy? Um, I could mention a couple that are going on in the uh, Title 20 program, um, one of which is a program called postponing sexual involvement, which has been implemented all across the entire state of Georgia and is showing reductions in teen pregnancy, birth, and abortion rates um, as a result of the program. Um, in Utah, there is a program that has been funded under AFL um, out of Brigham Young University. Um, it is operating not just in Utah, but um, in other states across the country. And it also is particularly showing improved family communication um, around sexuality issues and um, improved attitudes towards postponing sexual involvement. Would you say we're winning or losing the battle about teenage pregnancy? Are we winning or losing? I think we're making significant progress. Um, the rates went way up in the 1970s. They've now leveled off. Um, and I think we're, we're going to see some uh, changes in the trends in a, in a positive way. Do we need some new solutions that have not yet been suggested? To even make the make the battle even faster, when it when it even better. Well, I, we do believe that that would be one of the merits of a state-administered family planning program that it would allow states to come up with many diverse approaches to the teen pregnancy problem through family planning. What about the chairman's concern, which I think is legitimate, that some states would be, would pursue the objectives of Title X effectively and enthusiastically and willingly, other states would do it grudgingly, if at all. What do you, what's your argument, answer to that argument? I think it's a re legitimate argument for the chairman to raise. In other words, if a state is willing to do it, you'll get some good results. If a state is reluctant, you may not get any results at all. Well, I guess we have a higher view of, of um, states and do believe maybe I'm, that... Maybe I'm not really phrasing his, his, rec his uh, objection correctly. That's how I perceived your question, Mr. Well, chairman. No, would you yield to me? Yeah, I'd be happy to yield. Right now, under present law, states can take this program over and run it. 
they can subcontract and they can do the whole thing. And in fact, 33 states have done that. 17 have chosen not to. My question is, I, don't, I hope the 33 that are doing it are doing a good job, but if 17 don't even want to do the job, either because they don't feel that it's their responsibility to take it on or they feel it's already being done adequately, why should we at the federal government tell them that there'll be no family planning program in their state unless the state comes in as the grantee. Mr. Chairman, we cannot, um, a number of states operate their own family planning programs. We could not imagine that the state would um, totally reject funds under the family planning program and refuse to operate it. Um, uh, we would find that very unlikely. Okay. Now I have a, a question which you referred to in your answer to your previous question about the abortifacient drugs, particularly RU486. Is there any chance that the bill proposed by Mr. Wax and Mr. Mr. Madigan could develop research on that drug and perhaps, um, I was going to say, uh, supersede or at least go around the FDA regulations and FDA applications? Is there any danger of that? Well, there, there is no prohibition um, in his provision against any research on abortifacient drugs. That prohibition comes primarily through the Hyde Amendment and perhaps also through Section 108. So could, could that drug, R RU486, come into the country without going through the FDA approval? I do not believe so. There's no danger there? Okay. No, sir. Um, there's no way it could be marketed unless it goes through FDA as far as you're concerned? That is correct. Okay. The other question, are you concerned about the new elements? You mentioned you didn't like the new uh, expansions in the program. Would you be more specific as to why you don't like the proposals for expansion? Well, we believe that the current law is adequate and maybe for... Maybe name them one by one, if you don't mind, as okay, to which the, ones the, you object to, which ones you think might be all right, which ones you would modify. There's primarily three expansions. One is expanded authority for doing community-based information and education. Um, we believe that is already being done in the family planning program. It Where? is being done in satisfactory fashion through the 4,000 clinics that we fund now, as well as through a clearinghouse which we operate to provide information on a national basis. Um, the second expanded authority is for um, contraceptive research and um, uh, investigative research on uh, contraceptive effectiveness. We believe that that authority is not needed. We have that authority under current law as well as through the NIH statute. Um, and we're concerned about what is the purpose of expanding that authority. And then the final expansion is an expansion in the budget, and we don't believe that that is... Uh, of course, it's a consequence of the other, is it not? Um, expansion of the budget yes. is pretty much a consequence. Yes. What about the school-based clinics? What's your objection to that? That's uh, expanded in the bill. Well, we're very concerned about the mixed message that delivery of family planning services or family planning counseling um, that the mix, we're concerned about the mixed messages that that gives to adolescents and um, we therefore do not support expanding the involvement of family planning services into schools. Thank you Mr. Chairman. I have no further questions. Thank you Mr. Nielsen. A uh, couple points I want to pursue. First of all, I understand that Chairman Dingell disagrees with uh, Ms. Cabanis' assessment of his role in the legislative history of Title X with respect to the issue of abortion. I know he has written a, a letter to Dr. Bowen expressing his view on this, and I'd like uh, to have his letter be made part of the record without objection. The, um, you think Title XX is doing a good job? We do think that positive results are coming out of the Title 20 program, yes, both in terms of services to pregnant and parenting teens as well as services to non-pregnant teens. Why does the administration recommend to the Congress that we phase out Title 20 then? That is no longer the proposal of the administration. The proposal is that we um, fund the program at $10 million. Um, that was the proposal a year ago. Um, and since looking into the program further, particularly as it relates to the adoption issue, the um, administration realized that was not a wise proposal and we are supporting continued funding of the program. The, uh, you would like to have the states run the family planning programs and make the decisions as they see the needs in their own state. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, what if a state decided they wanted to have abortion services along with family planning? Should we prohibit it? 
That is prohibited in the proposal which we will be submitting to Congress. It may, it can, but why can't the states make that decision for themselves if they're going to make the decision of running the family planning pro program? Because we, we very much believe there are certain parameters that should be set at the federal level. We are proposing, for example, that the money only be spent on family planning services. It cannot be spent on uh, some other type of service unrelated to family planning. We also believe that general guidance should be set on what we mean by family planning. And one of the things we don't mean by family planning is the support of abortion as a method of family planning. Now, so you would have the federal law stay in effect as it relates to abortion services, uh, if, 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 even if the states were running the family planning program? That's correct. Dr. Wyndham, let me ask you a professional question. I'm not talking to you as the Assistant Secretary of Health, but you are a practicing cardiologist, in fact, a, a well-known cardiologist, I believe. Did you talk to your patients when someone came to you with a heart uh, problem? Did you discuss various treatments that they might consider, such as bypass surgery or using a cardiac balloon or using various drugs? Certainly, yes, sir. Suppose Medicare came in one day and told you by regulation that you couldn't talk to your patients about bypass surgery but only about balloons or certain drugs. In other words, it would be illegal for you to use Medicare money to talk about an option of a bypass uh, surgery. Would you support such a policy should the government tell you how to practice medicine? I do not feel that that would happen, sir, uh, because I don't think that uh, that would be... But if it did? If it did? If it did. Wouldn't you be against it? Yes. Now, abortion is legal. And in some cases, it's a recommended surgical procedure in the United States. How is the department's regulation prohibiting doctors and family planning clinics from discussing it any different from Healthcare Financing Administration telling cardiologists not to talk about a bypass, bypass surgery. I think he can answer this sure. question as a professional yeah. on yes. his own. In that case, uh, Mr. Chairman, the individual uh, who is pregnant is referred to a physician for, is able to be referred to a physician for discussion of the abortion. But abortion is not a part of family planning. No, if a doctor is talking to a woman who's pregnant and she comes in and she wants to talk about various options that are available to her, uh, can't, can't that doctor, should that doctor be prohibited from discussing abortion as an option? Well, once she's pregnant and she's planning her family, <clears throat> then he would discuss her option to carry the baby. And if she did not wish to do that, <clears throat> I mean, wish to keep the baby, the option of ad adoption is given to her. How about abortion? But then that's not part of the family planning. That is a termination but, of a pregnancy, which she then would be referred to, if she raised that, <coughs> raised that question, she'd be referred to physicians uh, in the community for prenatal care. A woman comes <clears throat> into a clinic. Right. She's a middle-aged woman. She's pregnant. But she has viral encephalitis or mononucleosis and CMV. Or a 13-year-old <clears throat> girl is pregnant from a rape. A mother of a dead Tay-Sachs syndrome child who's pregnant with a second fetus determined to have Tay-Sachs also. A young drug abusing woman pregnant and seropositive for AIDS. In each of these cases, let's say the woman comes into the clinic and talks to a physician. Should that physician be prohibited from saying to any of those women that it, in looking at their individual circumstances, an abortion is a medical procedure that is available to them? The direction would be to refer, <coughs> refer her to that site where she could, to that position where she could get the guidance and direction for her medical care. No, but the clinic would not if provide she that have an service. abortion. Certainly, <coughs> you have to be referred to a place where they yes. did abortions. Right. But in discussing the <coughs> options, why can't a physician be able to tell a woman in the, any of those circumstances that abortion is a possibility and they could give a referral if that's the poss if that's what she wanted. But the Title 10 program that we support and which we have in effect is for pre-pregnancy guidance and direction. Once the pregnancy has occurred, then that is not a part of the Title 10 program. And that's for where the individual who's pregnant, the female who's pregnant, is referred. So you don't think the program ought to be involved in that, but let's I'm asking you as a physician. Yes. If a woman comes to you mistakenly to a your office thinking that uh, you, you're, you're available to answer the questions on that subject. Mm -hmm. 
would you feel that you should not be permitted to talk about abortion as an option? Well, under that circumstance, if I were under the clinic direction of the federal funding as it is now, uh, I would not be able to do that. I would refer, though, to those who could do that for me. How is that different from the case of Medicare's paying you to handle an elderly patient's heart problem and the government came in as well and said to you, Doctor, you're under Medicare's payment for this patient. Don't you dare talk to this patient about bypass surgery. We've had a lot of costs for bypass surgeries. We don't want it encouraged. We don't even want you to discuss it. Would you think that there's any difference between those two cases? The difference, I think, Mr. Chairman, is that Medicare is not a program of planning or directing care. It's strictly a financial support mechanism. If you had a federal program, though, that you're speaking of, then we'd have to consider the evaluation at that time. But there's no, it's entirely different between Medicare giving dollars <coughs> for payment of service than would be the case in Title X, which is specifically a if, family planning program. If a woman comes into a family planning clinic, she should, should she be turned away <coughs> if she's pregnant? If a woman comes into a family planning clinic, should she be turned away and told, I'm sorry, you sh you're, we don't want to talk to you here, this is to avoid pregnancy, you're already pregnant, go somewhere else. If she's already pregnant, then she would be directed to services, medical services for that. So that you don't think they ought to discuss any options with her, they ought to have her referred elsewhere? Yes. How about adoption? <coughs> adoption about is a part of the planning. Well, that's not, that. that's not contraceptive planning. No, but that's the alternative to how to de deal with a baby after birth. But the fact abortion is also an alternative to deal with a baby after, uh, after, uh, after conception. Yes, but see the statute is, prohibits the involvement for federal... I'm not saying what the... I, I know that you keep on saying that the yes. statute prohibits yes. because your regulations prohibit and the administration doesn't want the discussion of an abortion as an yes. option. Right. But I'm asking you as a physician, if a woman comes in to see you and she's already pregnant, would you feel that in any way the government should tell you not to be able to mention abortion to her as an option? If I'm working in that clinic under the direction as it is now and receiving the federal funds for the program, then I would not be able to do so. But then should the government tell you you have to discuss abortion with her? I mean adoption with her? No, they didn't have to tell me. I could. You could. That's allowed. You think that, you think that should be allowed? Because you're not terminating a pregnancy at that point. You're not dealing with the uh, termination. The pregnancy can, would be continued. Well, what if she brings up the subject? She says to you, Doctor, I, I know adoption, giving the baby up for adoption is one choice. I know burying the child when the child's born with Tay-Sachs mm -hmm. is another choice. I know uh, the fact that I've been raped and I'm going to carry this baby to term is a choice, but I don't want to. I've heard about, I've heard about abortion. Do you think you should say to her at that point, I'm sorry, let's discuss the issue no further. I have no a right to discuss this with you? Well, my job at that particular clinic would not be to deliver or direct prenatal care. Now, you're not going to deliver. Or direct it. I would not be directing the care. I'd refer to one, to the, those who would be, in turn, able to give her the direction once she's pregnant. As far as carrying out... Let's say she comes into the clinic and she wants to be pregnant. She's excited about the possibility. She takes a pregnancy test, but in the workup, work up, you also find that her health is endangered. If she, I, I don't understand why you have to be whispered to, because you're a physician. Yes. Uh, uh, Ms. Cabanas, are you a physician? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, I'm not. Okay. Um, but uh, I, uh, excuse me, that's all I want to know. Now, Dr. Wyndham, you yes, are a physician. Yes, sir. Right. And a woman, and you've had more experience in dealing with patients, and, and, sure. and uh, I think you can give us guidance on this. A woman comes in to see you and, she, and she's really excited about being pregnant, she wants the pregnancy test, you do a, a workup and you find that she's got disease that she didn't realize she's going to have, her life is in danger if she carries this child to term. Do you think you're permitted to say to her, I've got some bad news for you, uh, and, this is, and think through with her, guide her into various options, one of which may be she could decide to have an abortion? At that very early stage, if her life is in danger, she's certainly not a candidate to stay in the clinic. She has to go for care. That's where she'd be directed for care of that status. But in directing her for care, can the doctor suggest that one of the options open to her is to go somewhere else to have an abortion? Because that's where the analysis would be made to determine whether 
her life was in danger to the point that the pregnancy would endanger her and possibly cause her death. So do you think a doctor under those circumstances where the life of the mother is in danger could discuss the abortion as an option? That's what would be done when she's referred to that doctor who's going to carry her through her pregnancy. So the clinic does, it, does not do that. Do the regulations that are now being suggested by the department say that abortion can be discussed as an option if the doctor determines that the life of the mother is in danger, but otherwise the doctor may not discuss the abortion as an option under any other circumstance? Well, when the mother's life is in danger, and that was the time that she is recommenda recommendation is made to save her life. Could you, as a physician, work in a clinic as a physician that requires that you not discuss ab abortions as an option, except under such very limited circumstances? Would you yes. personally stand for that? Well, if I were working in the, <coughs> in the clinic, sir, I would certainly abide by those directions and understand well, what did, the limitations you abide are. By whatever within that. regulations, but would you? feel as a professional physician that that would be an infringement on your right to practice good medicine as you might see it under each and every case? Well, working within that clinic, you assume the responsibilities and also the obligations that you have to meet to fulfill that job. And then you also realize that you have the alternative to refer the patient to a source where that can be dealt with and continued as far as the rest of pregnancy. So now you're, let's, let's get to a cardi cardiologist kind of situation. A, a woman uh, comes in, she's middle-aged, pregnant for the first time. She has a severe heart murmur and signs in the first few weeks of pregnancy of increasing cardiac difficulties. Would you as a physician feel obligated to tell this woman about uh, uh, the option of abortion in her case? That's beyond the scope of the clinic, sir. That's where the... No, no, no. I'm not asking about the clinic. I'm asking you as a physician. If well, this woman came to see you as a private physician... Oh, as a private physician? Sure. We'd have to determine, one, whether we can manage her condition with the heart failure and the... Right. You can discuss that. And if you can that. manage all that and uh, she goes through satisfactorily, fine. But if she can't be managed with drugs and with the program of adjustment to get her back to a stable condition, then the question would be, is she going to die if this pregnancy continues, at which time the obstetrician taking care of her would have to make a decision as to what that narrow boundary Doesn't is and when to, when to uh, offer the abortion if it's going to save Doesn't her life. Does she have a say in any of this? Well, I mean, you don't know certainly. for sure she's going to die. Well, no, but if you know her life's in danger to the point that it would, that's the question when you make well, that decision. Well, but then you discuss it with her, don't oh, you? Oh, certainly, yes. You say your life's in danger. Yes. You may not be able to live through this pregnancy. Yes. And it, you might recognize that fact and there's a legal legal procedure called abortion, which you may choose to have under these circumstances. You would say that to her, wouldn't you? The physician doing, yes, the one who's doing Any good it. physician would give her that information, even That's if right. you personally didn't like abortion. That's right. You think you, the yes, government she, should tell you you shouldn't discuss that with her and say that to her? No, she has a care, the doctor who's carrying her through pregnancy, they have the opportunity to discuss options. If that woman came into a family planning clinic and had the pregnancy test and uh, during the other workup medically they found that she had this medical problem that may not permit her to carry the child to term. Now she's in a clinic and the doctor in that clinic knows there are rules and regulations. You think it's reasonable to say to the doctor you can discuss with this woman Giving up the child for adoption is an option. You can discuss with this woman carrying the baby to term, where she may not make it, but you cannot discuss with this woman an option of going for an abortion somewhere else. Yes, but we refer, so she could be referred somewhere else if he felt as he Does saw. Does she have to bring up the subject of of abortion before the doctor can talk to her about it, or can the doctor mention no. her affirmatively that that's one of the options? Yes, he cannot talk to her about that option. But if it became the point that where he felt, that what he knew, that indicated that she needed further guidance in her pregnancy, he, she, he would refer her for that. For the purpose of even discussing the option. And for, that's right, because if somebody's going to carry her, carry her through the pregnancy, he needs to be able to step in as early as possible. Okay. I have uh, no further questions, Mr. Nielsen. I find it all quite incredible. 
And uh, I think, uh, obviously, you know, I think that this is a uh, continued attempt by this administration with these regulations to interfere with the practice of medicine as, as any responsible doctor would, would do under the circumstances in dealing with a doctor-patient relationship. It's a further effort to try to hinder the family planning clinics and to try to stifle the whole uh, program. And the idea of saying that states ought to run it when 33 already do is a further effort of the administration to abolish the family pro planning programs and say to the states, run it if you want, but we don't want to have family planning at all. Well, Mr. Westmoreland and my staff just raised another point, and I'll ask it. Suppose this woman goes to a clinic for poor people, not to a family planning clinic, and she has the same problem. She's pregnant, cardiac problems, may not live, th may or may not live throughout the pregnancy. Do you think she ought to be informed by a doctor in that, in that clinic, which is not a family planning clinic, but let's say a community health center? She ought to be permitted to be given the option by the doctor of abortion as one of the, one of the choices she might make? I'm sure they vary in the type of clinics you're referring to, and I'm not sure what their regulations are or their directions, sir. I'd have to... Well, what would you support? How about maternal and child health clinics? Do you think that they ought to have uh, the right in a maternal and child health pro uh, clinic that deals with poor women to discuss this option? What, do your ch what is your personal opinion on that? personal opinion, if it gets to the point where this is an issue that's going to affect her life and cause possibly her death during, if she carried a termination, that decision has to be made by those who are not, not prohibited from doing it, which these programs would allow. She'd have to get into a program and be directed there to where she could have that guidance. Well, let's say that, that uh, the federal government dis was deciding whether we should prohibit it or not, and they asked your view as a doctor. Should we prohibit the doctor from discussing this option with this woman in this clinic? After all, if you mention that option, she may take that option. Well, if that particular clinic uh, prohibits that, then that would be the way the action would have to be. So a poor woman who's pregnant, who has no other choice because she can't afford to see you when you were practicing medicine, or some other doctor who is in private practice, and she goes to a maternal child clinic with federal funds or taxpayer funds that support the idea of a poor woman getting these medical services while she's pregnant, you think that that's just, uh, that's just unfortunate, but she may not have the option of abortion even mentioned to her. In that circumstance, that would be the case. Okay. Thank, you, thank you very much, uh, all of you, for your presentation to us. We'll look uh, forward to uh, working on this legislation and further discussing this issue uh, and uh, hopefully not... Uh, not going through uh, a lot of acrimony if we can work some of these things out. Thank you very much. Our uh, next uh, witness is Dr. C. Earl Fox, the state health officer from the Alabama Department of Public Health. Dr. Fox has long been involved with the Title X family planning program from the state perspective and is here today to address that issue. He is appearing on behalf of both the state of Alabama as well as the American Public Health Association. Dr. Fox, we're pleased to have you with us today. Your written statement uh, will be made part of the record in full. We'd like to ask you to take no more than five minutes. And by the way, we're going to have to be very strict with you and all the other witnesses that are scheduled to testify uh, that uh, we will not uh, be able to go beyond the five-minute uh, time period. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee. Uh, I am Dr. Earl Fox, State Health Officer for the Alabama Department of Public Health. And I'm pleased to have the opportunity to testify regarding the reauthorization of the Title X legislation. I've been fortunate to have been able to work uh, in the family planning program at all levels as a clinician initially 15 years ago, uh, actually providing family planning services, later served to administer the program at a sub-state, and then later state level. I've served as a maternal and child health director for some six years, and finally assumed ultimate responsibility as state health officer. And it's from this experience base that I testify today. A comprehensive family planning program results, in my opinion, in many benefits. 
These benefits include improved health by spacing of pregnancies, by early detection of health problems, and prevention of unwanted pregnancies. These benefits impact the total health of the individual and the diagnostic services of the program enhance the concept of primary care for the patient. Comprehensive family planning services represent an attempt to deal with the health, social, and economic problems associated, at least in part, with the occurrence of unwanted and mistimed pregnancies in America. For many poor women, entry into a system of health care often begins in the family planning clinic. Screening and referral for problems as well as health education and counseling are components of family planning clinic services in addition to the physical exam. Also include a related laboratory test such as pap smears and sexually transmitted disease testing and the provision of contraceptive supplies. These services enable women to space and or prevent pregnancies and, in, and achieve improved health through the prevention of high-risk pregnancies, early detection of breast and cervical cancers, sexually transmitted diseases, hypertension, and other health problems. Infertility services are also provided for persons who desire pregnancy. Information and education programs that are designed to achieve community understanding of the state program's objectives and to inform the community of the availability of services are ongoing in each program area. The service program is buttressed by a training program for clinic personnel, community education activities, and strict evaluation requirements to ensure program accountability. In Alabama during 1987, a total of 83,372 women were provided medical family planning services. These patients received over 591 health screenings. Included in this total were 69,000 pap smears, 76,000 bimanual pelvic examinations, 63,000 urine examinations, 132,000 blood pressure determinations, 60,000 blood tests, 6,600 sickle cell tests, and 107,000 tests for sexually transmitted diseases. In many states, the family planning program is a vital part of an integrated health care system that includes all personal health services, such as prenatal care, child health services, WIC, Women, Infant, and Children Supplemental Nutrition Program, cancer detection, sexually transmitted disease detection and treatment, hypertension treatment, and immunizations. In our integrated clinic services module, we view family planning often as an entry point to other health services. Many state programs also have family planning agreements with the federally funded primary care or community health centers, particularly in the South. For the past 18 years, Title X has been the primary force in our efforts to reduce the number of unintended pregnancies among teenagers and poor women in general. There are more than 5 million poor women and teens served through Title X clinics each year throughout this country. Each year, there are more than 800,000 pregnancies averted, more than half among teens through Title X agencies. As a result, the Title X National Program helps avert more than 400,000 abortions each year. Family planning not only has a positive impact upon the health status of the community, but it greatly reduces human suffering from wife abuse, child abuse, nutritional problems, and abject poverty. Infant and maternal morbidity and mortality are reduced as a result of successful family planning programs. We're fortunate at this time to see an aggressive movement from Congress and many other states toward reducing infant mortality and infant deaths. A major component of this reduction is and must continue to be the provision of family planning services to low-income women. Family planning is the primary federal state program aimed at the prevention of unintended adolescent pregnancies. The family planning program supports the establishment and maintenance of clinics which, which are crucial in reaching geographic areas that are medically underserved. Because program participation is not limited solely to persons on welfare, the near poor and many teenagers are able to avoid falling into poverty as a result of an unintended pregnancy. The consequences of teenage pregnancy and childbearing have been well documented and widely publicized. While some teenagers assume the responsibilities of parenthood without major problems, particularly if they have the support of their families, the consequences for most young people are adverse and long-lasting. Teenage pregnancy continues to be a major problem in Alabama and the nation. Half of all teen pregnancies occur within the first six months after sexual activity begins. Unfortunately, unfortunately most teenagers wait at least nine months before beginning contraceptive activity. Thank you, Dr. Parsons. The rest of that statement will be in the uh, record. You're, uh, are you a physician? Yes, sir. Uh, you work for the government of the state of Alabama? Yes, sir. Do you consider that your, the ethics of your profession are, uh, are put on hold uh, while you work for the government? I would hope they would not be. Uh, how ethical is it for a physician not to tell a patient that her life may be endangered and that in order to avoid that consequence, there is a legal medical procedure 
that may uh, save her life? Mr. Chairman, I believe that is an ethical responsibility. And in fact, I had a situation uh, while working in the health department where that happened to me. And I had a woman, a 20-year-old woman, who had two sisters that died from a previous pregnancy, came in for birth control pills. Uh, at the time of her first uh, family planning visit, was already pregnant again, was in florid heart failure, and uh, really would have died if, if some referral had not been made at that time. If a doctor, uh, even if because there was some rule in the clinic, didn't discuss with a patient a possible medical option, and the patient then died or suffered uh, grievous uh, harm, could that doctor be uh, sued for medical malpractice? I would assume they could. Do, you th do doctors who deal with poor women in public clinics at the federal or state level have an immunity from, medical mal from the same medical standards of practice that doctors who are providing services to a patient to privately pay for it? No, sir. In fact, we ought to be held to a higher standard because many of those women cannot have, cannot have the resources or don't have the resources to go somewhere else. I find it incredible that the federal government of the United States would say to poor women that even though we'll pay for their medical services, we won't pay for one medical service, that's abortion. I find that disturbing. But I find it really uh, uh, extremely reprehensible to say that we won't even tell a poor woman that there's an option that may save her life called abortion, even if we won't pay for it. I suppose that's more a rhetorical statement, but uh, certainly want to get my feelings on the record. You just heard Dr. Wyndham make the administration's case for making Title X into a block grant program. They've been trying to make this case for eight years. Last year it was such an unpopular idea they couldn't even get anyone to introduce it as a bill. Now you're a state a health officer and your state, I believe, is a Title X grantee. So you, you, if you have a block grant, you would be in the same kind of situation, I suppose. How would, how would you respond to the idea of, uh, of this proposal to make the family planning program a block grant program as opposed to a federal program as it is today? Mr. Chairman, I prescribe to the uh, saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And uh, my experience over the 15 years I've been in public health has been that the federal family planning program, in my opinion, has been one of the best run, highest quality programs we've had the opportunity to deal with. And uh, the entities that are out there now providing family planning services, I think, are doing a good job and uh, should be left pretty much as it presently is constituted. I understand that the uh, state of Alabama is one of 36 state uh, health departments that ha uh, commented on the HHS February 1988 regulations. If these regulations were go into effect, what would be their impact on the delivery of family planning services in Alabama? We feel that they would certainly uh, restrict our ability to provide adequate services, uh, to make referrals, and to give the type of service to, to women, in particular low-income women, that we are trying to deliver through the health department clinics. Thank you very much. Mr. Nielsen? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Fox. I think my brother-in-law, Tom Hunt, knows you, working in the yes. state system down there in Alabama. Um, you note that family planning clinics encourage teens to involve their parents in their decision about using contraceptives. Yes, sir. Um, using contraception, excuse me. Would you describe the steps they're taking to do that, to inform the teens and, and encourage them to involve their parents? We have training programs statewide that we, we mandate to all of our employees, and these are ongoing. And part of those training programs require that all of our nursing staff, our staff within the clinics, when an individual, a teenager, comes in uh, for family planning services, regardless of the type of service, that they're encouraged to involve their families, to talk to their parents about their sexuality, about uh, the contraception, and uh, it, it is an ongoing part of our entire statewide family planning program. Uh, do you find that Title 10 and Title 20 are in conflict with each other, or are they complementary? I don't believe they're in conflict. Uh, my concern is I would not like to see one to the exclusion of the other, and I think that uh, certainly there's room for both. Uh, some uh, individuals need to be counseled, and we encourage trying to, to work with teenagers to delay the onset of sexual involvement, sexual intercourse. There are a lot of reasons to do that. On the other hand, recognizing that uh, many of the teenagers are going to be sexually active, and out of 20,000 case, 20, cases of gonorrhea in Alabama in 86, 6,600 were in uh, children age 10 to 19, so many will be, and I, I think that there is room for both. Okay, now you had, you mentioned you had 83,372 member uh, women in the Title X program in Alabama in 1987. Yes. Could you break that down as how many were adolescent or how many were not? 
Yes, sir. Uh, the, yeah. the, I'll be, Go ahead. Uh, In general, could yes. you break it down by age all the way through? I don't have that with me. I can give it to you, but I can just tell you uh, that in general, uh, one third of our patient population are teenagers, 19 and under. Uh, less than 1% are under age 14. If you'd supply that breakdown by age, I'd be in a, oh, very interested. Also, could you break it down by income? How many would be considered low income? All right, if we have that information, I'll be glad to give it to you, sure will. you have an idea about that? Not, not at this time, though, sir. Okay. Uh, you, stated, you stated that teenage pregnancy continues to be a major problem in Alabama and the nation. How are we doing on teenage pregnancy? Are we winning the battle against it or, or losing it? Yes, sir, I think we're winning it. Our pregnancy percent, even though it's 17.4, is on the decline and has been on the decline since the early uh, 80s. So I think we are winning the battle, although the rates are still very high. Uh, you say if it's not broke, don't fix it, or you, you said it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, is it possible that the administration's approach to go to the state directly might be an improvement, or do you think it better not to do that? Well, I have some concerns. Uh, we sometimes uh, all tend to, to get upset with requirements uh, for various programs, uh, but I think that the family planning program, although we fuss sometimes about the things that we have to do, certainly has a, a high set of standards, particularly as far as follow-up of medical problems such as abnormal pap smears. And uh, I would be concerned in a either block grant situation or any type of, of different administration other than what we have now that the quality of the program might suffer. Is your concern that of the chairman's that some states just wouldn't do it? I think that's true. There's a variety of interest among the states. Uh, some states are, are more involved in it. Also, state health departments vary a great deal in their provision and involvement in direct medical services. Well, I congratulate you. Apparently, you have one of the better, better programs in the country, and you personally are better qualified than most. And I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Let me just ask you one other question. Uh, we have the uh, possibility of Title X programs playing a critical role in helping to prevent the transmission of the AIDS virus. Do you believe that uh, we need a strong federal anti-discrimination policy in place as part of any testing and counseling program that may be offered in family planning clinics? Mr. Chairman, we are offering uh, AIDS tests to all of our family planning patients on a voluntary basis, not mandatory. Uh, but we do support and, and are very interested in and think the federal government should initiate some type of anti-discrimination legislation. I'd like to see it done either at the state or federal level, and I think uh, it's going to be very difficult to go state by state, and it, it needs to be there. Yes, sir. Do family planning clinics have the resources in terms of both dollars and personnel to carry out an adequate AIDS testing and counseling program? I can't speak for the other agencies, Mr. Chairman. We're going to do it and pull the money out of other sources, but as you know, our family planning doctor dollars have not gone up very much during the, the uh, last several years, and uh, we, are, we are increasingly uh, subsidizing our family planning program out of other monies at state level, and I would assume that for most states, including ours, additional dollars would be needed. What would be the impact on the Alabama Title X program if you were required to test and counsel every person who came through your clinic door? It would cost us several hundred thousand dollars uh, more than we, we uh, spend right now. The AIDS test cost us on an average in our state laboratory approximately $10 per test. On the private market, it would be between $50 and $100 per test. You multiply that by the number of patients, 83,000. Some of those receive more than one visit a year. The counseling itself is, is time consuming and should take anywhere from at least 20 minutes to an hour. So it would be quite costly. Appreciate that. Do you have anything further? Appreciate very much your testimony and your willingness to be with us here. Our uh, third panel comprises both individuals and representatives of organizations with a longstanding interest in the Title X program. Ms. Joanne Gasper is the former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Population Affairs within the Department of Health and Human Services. In that capacity, she was responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the Family Planning Program. Dr. Stan E. Weed is the director of the Institute for Research and Evaluation in Salt Lake City, Utah. Representing the National Right to Life Committee is Dr. Richard Glasso, who is the committee's director of education. And finally, Mr. Michael Schwartz is here on behalf of the Free Congress Research and Education Foundation. Mr. Schwartz is a resident fellow in social policy at the foundation. I want to thank uh, all of you for appearing before the subcommittee today. Your written uh, testimony will be made part of the record in full. We are unfortunately going to have to limit your oral presentation to us uh, to no more than five minutes, and we'll have to be very strict about that. Ms. Gaspar?
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm delighted to be here today. And as you indicated, I will be testifying uh, as the former DASPA. I have had quite a bit of experience with the family planning program. I joined the Department of Health and Human Services back in 1981. And from then until my departure in 1987, I uh, had oversight as well as operational responsibilities for the program. And therefore, I would like to tell you that there has been a conspiracy of silence and a cover-up regarding how Title X is operated. The President ordered the National Family Planning Program to be cleaned up of any taint of abortion and unfortunately required the President to act in this regard, and that is because of the p powerful influence of the abortion industry. It took a presidential directive to begin the process to stop taxpayer support of abortion and abortion-related activities by the National Family Planning Program. Since Title X was originally enacted, program practice has deviated significantly from program law and program policy. This lack of compliance with the law has resulted in a program which unlawfully promotes, advocates, and encourages abortion, a program which rapes the minds of children, undermines family values, and operates without regard to community standards. The President ordered HHS to issue regulations which will bring program practice into compliance with law. All the regulations could go farther, they are a reasonable beginning. The regulations will prevent grantees from providing abortion counseling, something which has never been legally permitted within the program. Let's set the record straight. Title X grantees, like other organizations that receive federal funds, have an option. They may operate the programs the way Congress intends, or they shouldn't take the taxpayer's money. The choice is theirs. What is not supposed to happen is that tax money is taken and then the law disregarded. Unfortunately, that is what has happened with the Title X Family Planning Program. The money has been taken and the law has been ignored. The abortion industry is very upset with the regulations and they're upset for a very simple reason. They will lose money. I can't tell you exactly how much, but a lot. When you look at their arguments in opposition to the regulations, the uh, abortion providers talk about ha there having been $150 million of support and subsidies to uh, abortion and abortion-related activities out of the Title X program. I should point out that abortion providers often frequently claim that their constitutional rights will be denied if taxpayers do not support their programs. And I should say that don't forget roughly a third of the people who receive services out of Title X are children who get services without any sort of parental consent or parental not notification. So telling the Title X clinics that are I mean, cleaning up the abortion uh, constitutional right issue to say that they can't do it. In other words, it, the, the opponents are arguing that to prevent abortion counseling violates constitutional rights is like saying that the taxpayers should provide bullets to 12-year-olds and then tell them where to go get a gun uh, in order to protect their constitutional right to bear arm, arms. Nor will the regulations require any violation of informed consent or medical standards. Title X is not supposed to pay for abortion. It's not supposed to promote abortion. Um, Title X, there is supposed to be a clear and separate distinction between Title X, a wall of separation between Title X and abortion. And to <coughs> talk about abortion, to try to get informed consent for abortion is clearly outside of the scope of the program. Fortunately, when the courts uphold the regulations, DHHS, the Department of Health and Human Services, will be able to clean out the taint of abortion throughout the entire program, and it's very much needed. There are still other programs, uh, problems with the National Family Planning Program. As I said earlier, the program rapes the minds of children, undermines family values, and operates without regard to community standards. Uh, as an example of this attack on children, there's sex education curriculum funded by Title X, totally funded by Title X. This curriculum is designed to support homosexual activity. The authors state that the curriculum is, quote, and I quote their comments, a radical approach to sexuality, end quote. The program teaches, and again, if I may quote, the program is a, the problem is a homophobic society and, the pro, and helps affirms their, their students, helps students affirm their sexuality. The author um, is distressed that society, and again, I quote from the author of the book, uh, quote, presents homosexuality as a deviant behavior, a problem similar to the problems of transvesti transvestitism or pedophilia, or at best an alternative lifestyle. 
another stated objective is to expose the misogyny, uh, literally hatred of women that we believe young men have, end quote. Mr. Chairman, I am embarrassed to quote some of the passages from this book. Uh, it is an example of federal funds being spent without disregard to Title X statutory requirement. The curriculum states it is unrealistic to expect parents to participate. It is unrealistic to, and even undesirable in most cases to include parents in the program. That is at conflict with the statute. It's simply outrageous that tax dollars are going to support anti-family, militant, homosexual ideologues. Congress should ensure that the family planning program, which has a very valuable role to play, is involved in services. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Weed? My name is uh, Stan. <coughs> my name is Stan Weed. Um, my PhD is in social psychology from the University of Washington with special emphasis in research methodology, quantitative methods, and data analysis in an applied research context. I'm the director of the Institute for Research and Evaluation, which is a nonprofit research corporation focusing on social problems and policies related to adolescence, particularly teen pregnancy, drug abuse, etc. Because of this focus, today's hearing has particular interest to us since Title X programs have been proffered as a solution to the serious social and economic problems associated with teen pregnancy. Title X, of course, addresses other, other issues, but our intent is to speak to the legislation as it relates to teen pregnancy. As an institute, we have engaged in extensive study and research in the area of teen pregnancy, examined its social and psychological dimensions, its causes and consequences, and the variety of programs and approaches offered as solutions. We have looked carefully at family life and sex education approaches, family planning approaches, and the more broadly based enhanced life option models. Out of all of this, we suggest some basic criteria by which potential solutions, including this legislation, can be evaluated. Ultimately, it is effective solutions that all of us are interested in. Solutions to problems are like keys to locks. No matter how elegant they are, no matter how well intended they are, no matter how popular they are, if they don't fit, they don't work. Consider the following as guidelines for developing solutions that fit the problems, that increase the probability of succeeding. Briefly stated, they are as follows. First, the solution should take into account the stages of emotional, cognitive, and social development of the adolescent population. Many of our national and state policies and programs have done this with respect to driving, voting, drinking, contractual relations, etc. All of these activities require a certain level of adult-like judgment and responsibility that will minimize risk to self and others. This maturity is directly linked to developmental capacity as well as experience. Unfortunately, the Title X approach for teen pregnancy was a wholesale transition of adult-relevant assumptions to an adolescent population where those assumptions were not valid. The extension of a program originally designed to serve poor adult women into the area of teen pregnancy prevention has been both simplistic and overly narrow. Second, the solution should take into account the significant factors and determinants of adolescent behavior, including their future orientation, their sense of control over their own lives, their belief and value systems, more broadly their sense of identity. Adolescent sexual activity and pregnancy rates are directly related to these internal psychological dimensions as well as their social context. By by not taking these into account, our potential for, for succeeding is drastically reduced. Title X does not address them. Third, we must take into account the cultural norms and circumstances and try to capitalize on the cultural deterrence to pregnancy. As a recent report by the Rand Corporation emphasizes, teenage women who become single mothers and those who avoid pregnancy constitute a highly diverse population. The factors and determinants of adolescent sexual and childbearing behavior mentioned above vary considerably with that cultural diversity. A single-minded universal solution of contraceptive services to teens, such as Title X promotes, has little hope of making a difference. Fourth, we cannot rely primarily on the educational informational model for changing sexual behavior. Numerous and recent national studies have demonstrated the limitations of the informational model as a solution to teen pregnancy. These programs increase knowledge, but have little direct impact on values and attitudes, actual sexual behavior, use of birth control, and teenage pregnancy. Neither pregnancy education nor contraceptive education exerts any significant effect on the risk of premarital pregnancy among sexually active teenagers. On the whole, the latest and best research on sexuality education as a deterrent to problems of teen pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases indicates that sex education programs as they now exist are not an effective solution. This does not imply that information should not be used. It simply means we can't rely on it to solve the problem and that it will most likely be helpful only in the context of the other criteria we are proposing here. 
Fifth, we cannot simply rely on the medical technical solution of contraception to solve the problems associated with adolescent sexuality. We have analyzed data for all 50 states in the District of Columbia over a several year period to determine the net effectiveness of family planning programs for teens. We use both cross-sectional and longitudinal data and control for other correlates of teen pregnancy such as poverty, urbanization, mobility, race, prior fertility, etc. We found that rather than the predicted reduction of two to three hundred pregnancies per thousand additional teen family planning clients, there were between 40 and 90 more pregnancies depending on the year. We did observe fewer birth rates, fewer births per thousand clients, but also found about 120 more abortions per 1,000 teen clients. The reduction in the birth rate was not due to a reduction in the initial occurrence of pregnancy, but to more frequent termination of pregnancy through abortion. Researchers from the Allen Guttmacher Institute in New York have also found, using similar data, that family planning enrollment rates were associated with lower birth rates, but higher abortion and pregnancy rates. The program assumption that, in, that increased availability and accessibility of contraceptive services and counseling to teens would reduce the rate of teenage pregnancy is simply not valid. Thank you, Dr. Weed. We're going to have to stop here, and we'll have the rest of that statement in the record. Thank you very much. Mr. Schwartz. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Nielsen. Whoop. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Nielsen. My name is Michael Schwartz. I'm resident fellow in social policy for the Free Congress Research and Education Foundation here in Washington. The reduction of out-of-wedlock pregnancies among teenagers has been a main objective of the Title X program. This goal has repeatedly been advanced in the past as a justification for increased funding for the program, but after more than a decade and a half of experience, the results show conclusively that the Title X program has not only failed to attain that objective, but has actually contributed to making the situation worse. In 1970, the year before Title X went into effect, there were approximately 300,000 pregnancies to unmarried teenagers, of which two-thirds ended in live out-of-wedlock birth and one-third in abortions. Over the next decade, the enrollment of teenagers in family planning clinic programs increased fivefold. The prevalence and regularity of contraceptive use among sexually active teenagers increased dramatically, and teenage contraceptive users shifted from reliance on such crude and ineffective methods as the condom to the most sophisticated methods, especially oral contraceptives. In reaching its target population and in changing their behavior in the desired direction, Title X was enormously successful. But nonetheless, by 1980, more than 700,000 unmarried teenagers became pregnant, two-thirds of those pregnancies resulting in abortion and one-third in live out-of-wedlock birth. Despite the five-fold increase in abortions among unmarried teenagers, the increase in out-of-wedlock pregnancy was so, so great that the out-of-wedlock birth numbers were one-third higher in 1980 than they had been in 1970. Up to this point, it was possible for defenders of the Title X program to claim that this was mere coincidence, that out-of-wedlock teen pregnancies might have been even more numerous without Title X. But in 1981, funding for the family planning services under Title X was cut from about $160 million to about $120 million. The enrollment of teenagers in family planning clinic programs declined proportionately in 1981. And in 1981, for the first time on record, the number of out-of-wedlock pregnancies among teenagers declined by about 2%. In the following year, with Title X funds still at the reduced levels, the number of out-of-wedlock teen pregnancies declined again by an additional 3%. In 1983, the funding was increased to 142 million. The enrollment of teenagers in family planning clinic programs began to increase again, and out-of-wedlock teen pregnancies began to climb back up to their peak 1980 levels. Rarely in history has any public policy initiative so clearly and so directly affected a social problem. The more the federal government spends on family planning services, the more unmarried teenagers get pregnant. Only one action of the federal government has ever led to a reduction in the number of premarital teenage pregnancies. That was the reduction in family planning service funds under Title X in 1981. The reason for this is clear. Increased federal funding of family planning services targeted at, un at unmarried teenagers leads to an increase in sexual activity among that population. It is axiomatic that you get more of what you subsidize, and Title X has subsidized premarital sexual activity among teenagers. Despite massive changes over the past 15 years in the rates of sexual activity and the prevalence and patterns of contraceptive use among teenagers, one factor has remained almost perfectly constant. In study after study, the proportion of sexually active unmarried teenagers who experience a pregnancy has always been within two and a half percentage points of 30 percent. Experience has proved that the only way to reduce the number of unmarried teenagers who become pregnant is to reduce the number who are exposed to the risk of pregnancy by becoming sexually active. 
The 1981-82 reduction in Title X funds had that effect, and every increase in Title X funds has had the opposite effect. It is clear, therefore, that there are only two ways Congress can contribute to a reduction in premarital teenage pregnancy. The first is through a massive reduction in family planning service funds under Title X. On the basis of past experience, we can estimate that for every million dollars cut from this program, there will be 500 fewer premarital teen pregnancies within a year. The other way is to disqualify unmarried minors from receiving family planning services under this program. It is unjust and unreasonable to require taxpayers to subsidize the sexual adventures of fornicating teenagers. If teenagers are mature enough to be sexually active, they're mature enough to purchase their own contraceptives. And if the lack of a federally funded contraceptive serves as a deterrent to premarital sexual activity, then so much the better. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Weed. Dr. Glasso? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Nielsen, I'm Richard Glaso, Director of Education for the National Right to Life Committee, NRLC. The National Right to Life Committee is the nation's major pro-life organization. We represent about 2,500 local pro-life chapters. We are advocates for those innocent human beings whose right to life is threatened by abortion, infanticide, or euthanasia. NRLC and its affiliates take no position whatever on contraception, properly so called. We recognize, however, that Title X is currently a major source of funds for certain organizations which treat abortion as simply one birth control option among many. But rather than discuss that long-running controversy which is now before the courts, I will devote my brief time addressing two provisions of your bill which would greatly compound the abortion-related controversy which has surrounded Title X in recent years. I refer to provisions which, per which would permit the use of Title X funds for school-based clinics and for research on new abortion abortifacient drugs such as the RU-46 abortion pill. Section 5 of H.R. 3769 establishes a grant program with respect to information and education with special emphasis on adolescents and parents. The Executive Director of the National Family Planning and Reproductive Health Association, NEFRA, acknowledged to a Washington Post reporter last year that the parallel provision in the Senate Companion Bill would permit Title X funds to go to school-based clinics, SBCs. The language in your bill would also clearly permit such funding. SBCs have engendered great controversy in communities across the nation. Much of this controversy is due to the fact that such clinics provide abortion counseling and either direct or indirect abortion referrals to a captive clientele made up mostly of minors, often without parental knowledge or consent. If any Title X money reaches a school-based clinic, that SBC would be required by federal law to provide pregnancy testing, abortion counseling, and referral for abortions without requiring parental notification or consent, even if the state legislature or the local school board has explicitly forbidden abortion-related services, and even if the state law or local school board policy requires parental consent. Mr. Chairman, I was present for a March 2, 1988 speech by a leaning expert and supporter of school-based clinics, Douglas Kirby, Director of Research for the Center for Population Options. Dr. Kirby has completed a preliminary analysis of a large study of existing school-based clinics, which revealed that school-based clinics have, quote, no measurable impact, unquote, on pregnancy rates. Mr. Chairman, your bill also incorporates a so-called contraceptive development initiative that's been pushed for several years on a variety of vehicles by Planned Parenthood and its allies. Unless this provision is clarified by amendment, it is predictable that some of the authorized funds will be directed toward further development of a new generation of abortion-causing drugs, such as the RU-486 abortion pill. The problem arises because your bill avoids defining the term contraceptive. Of course, it was once generally understood that a contraceptive was something that prevents conception which was defined as fertilization the union of the human sperm and ovum, which is the beginning of the life of each human being. Now, many abortion advocates are referring to the RU486 abortion pill as contraceptive or a morning after pill, even though it is intended for use and, being as, and is being used abroad to induce abortions after implantation in the uterus, after a pregnancy is known to exist, and up to about 10 weeks after fertilization. RU486 is not an abortion pill, Rather, as Time Magazine called it, it is a, quote, month after pill. The Population Council, Planned Parenthood, and other proponents of this abortion pill are frustrated because American pharmaceutical companies are not pursuing FDA approval to market such drugs in the United States for two reasons. First, any drug company which approaches the FDA for approval to market an abortion pill would become the target of a massive boycott by pro-life organizations and churches. Second, RU-46 has many dangerous side effects 
it has the potential to be a, a chemical Dalcon shield. Incidentally, NRLC is opposed to proposed changes in product liability laws which would shield pharmaceutical companies from liability for inju injuries caused by such drugs. The parallel provision in Senate Companion Bill S-1366 explicitly speaks of, quote, bringing new contraceptives to the marketplace, unquote. That particular phrase does not appear in your bill. I assume it was dropped for tactical reasons, but the deliberate ambiguity remains. Mr. Chairman, I understand that amendments will be offered to your bill to correct the problems that I have touched on here. In its current form, NRLC is strongly opposed to H.R. 3769 and will urge all pro-life members of the House to oppose it as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Could I correct? I was just alerted something. Um, yes. Are you, I, I think I made a misstatement. Um, RU46 is an abortion pill and it is a month after pill. I think I might have made a misstatement as I was reading. Thank you, sir. Record will reflect that uh, correction on your part. Uh, Professor Weed and Mr. Schwartz, both of you suggest that family planning services lead to an increase in teenage pregnancy. Yet neither of you seem to take into account the phenomenal, and I agree undesirable, increase in teenage sexual activity over the past 20 years. <coughs> that I, I have show that there, are, there was a two-thirds increase in sexual activity in the 1970s. That's right. And that over the same time period there was a 10% increase in teenage uh, pregnancy. That's Doesn't wrong. this suggest that contraception has been working? No, there was not a 10% increase in teenage pregnancy during that period. There was about a 150% increase in teenage pregnancy during that period. But, uh, uh, but the, uh, you will also note Could that... we have a, uh, a study for the record that would indicate that figure? Oh, do you mean, do you mean an increase of 10 percentage points or an increase in the number of teenagers who became pregnant? You made the statement that there was a 150 percent increase right. in The number of pregnancy. teenagers who were pregnant, in uh, unmarried teenagers who were pregnant in 1970 was about 300,000. The number of teenagers who were unmarried and pregnant in 1980 was over 700,000. So that's approximately 150 percent increase in the number of out-of-wedlock teen pregnancies yeah, over I'd that like decade. To, I'd like you to submit that. I agree that the number of teenage births out of wedlock has gone up, but it seems that it's not the, the number of teenage births which That's has been right. going down for decades, even before family planning and abortion were widely available. But instead, the striking decrease is in the number of teenagers getting married. Oh, no. Teenagers are not at all getting married anymore. Uh, not nearly the numbers they were doing so before, Mr. Waxman. How uh, is family planning... Fewer teenagers are married, and as a consequence of that, a greater proportion of the births to teenagers are out-of-wedlock births. In 1970, about one-third of the births were non-marital. By 1980, uh, they, it was about half, and currently a majority of births to teenagers are out of wedlock. How but that's only a small proportion of all uh, pregnancies among teenagers, and especially of all pregnancies among unmarried teenagers, because two-thirds of the pregnancies to unmarried teenagers end in abortion. How is the family planning program responsible for the decisions of teenagers not to get married? I'll be happy to explain that, sir. There are three, not not, not to get married, but to become sexually active before they No, that's married. not my question. Oh, well, what it is not at all responsible for the decision of teenagers not to get married. It is responsible, I submit, for the decision of teenagers to become sexually active and therefore to expose themselves to the risk of premarital pregnancy. But that pregnancy rate hasn't gone up. That pregnancy rate has gone up 150 percent in 10 years. The premarital pregnancy rate has the gone up. The unmarried teenage pregnancy rate has gone up. The marriage rates has gone down. That's right. Therefore, if there's more sexual activity and more pregnancy, you find that when they're not married, it's unmarried women having, uh, becoming pregnant. Yes, now, exactly. That means and that that's are, the social that, problem that Title well, X is designed to. I'm not denying the problem. I'm not denying that it's right. a matter of, of great concern. That's but right. it seems to me quite sweeping to say the family planning program is responsible for all the unmarried pregnancy when we can't show why the family planning program is leading people not to get married. Well, I was about to... No, no, sir. The, the, the reason why premarital pregnancy is increasing is not because people are not getting married. It is because more unmarried teenagers are beginning to become sexually active. That is something which the family planning pl uh, clinic program contributes to. It contributes to it in three ways. First of all... Well, no, no, excuse me. The well, I'm about I have... to answer the question you've no, been trying to ask me. Excuse me. Yourself. I wanted okay. you to understand specifically what I want answered. The question I have is, based on the fact that the data shows that, that while there's a two-thirds increase in teenage sexual activity in the 70s, at the same time per period there was a 10% increase in teenage pregnancy. That is incorrect, sir. 
The increase so in premarital teenage pregnancy was 150 percent. Teenage pregnancy, married and unmarried. Teenage pregnancy, married and unmarried. That's correct. I don't know what that number is, but I doubt that it was. Well, the uh, figure only I have is a 10 percent increase. increase. I think that married teenagers becoming pregnant and having babies is not a social problem. It is not the kind of problem that Title X is designed to present, and it's not my business or well, anybody else's. Well, I, I must beg to differ with you. <laughs> Title X family planning programs is not just for unmarried people. It's well, for married people. It's for people who want to be able to control when and if they're going to have children. Fine, but, and, and maybe but married women child. having babies is not a social problem. Unmarried women having babies well, is a, a social problem. Well, it's a problem that they might want to have addressed by being able to go to a clinic and get some contraceptive information that's why I and propose, some advice. Sir, that's why I propose, sir, that only unmarried minors be, be disqualified from family planning services under this program. M okay. With Thank due you. respect, Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Excuse I... Excuse me. I, 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 uh, we've had the testimony, and I want to ask some questions, but I do want to ask you a question, Ms. Gasper, because I was intrigued by that analogy you made between giving teenagers advice as to where to buy bullets for a gun, which is legal under most laws, and some people claim even the constitutional right to bear arms, and that's the same analogy of why we shouldn't tell teenagers about abortion. But what about grown-ups? The, the why shouldn't a grown-up be told that, well, I don't like people to have guns, they can go buy a gun. While you may not like the idea they may choose to have an abortion, a doctor should be able to tell them that an abortion is an option. That is very fine as long as tax dollars are not supporting that advocacy activities. I would no more support tax dollars supporting the National Rifle Association to go and argue uh, for the right to bear arms than I would for Planned Parenthood to get if Title X funds to argue for the right to have an abortion. Well, you, you uh, talk about tax dollars, but if tax dollars are going to a clinic, and you maybe don't think the family planning program under any circumstances ought to be there, but if the Congress decided, which it did, that we want tax dollars to go to fund clinics where women can come in and get information about their health, maternal, child health, contraception. If a woman comes into a clinic, it uh, seems to me that, uh, that they, she ought to have the right to get the information. A grown-up woman ought to have the right to get the information available to uh, protect her health and maybe even to save her life. Okay. Congress, in its wisdom, enacts many statutes. And normally when you enact a statute, you give you say you want the dollars, the tax dollars, to, sp to be spent for a specific purpose. Under Title X, there was a very explicit prohibition that the Title X program is not to promote uh, abortions or advocate in favor of abortion. There's a long statutory history, uh, there's a long legislative history, and there are numerous general counsel opinions that say that abortion is outside of the Title X program. I don't, therefore, I don't disagree. Therefore, no, title do, no, no federal funds should be used in the Title X program to promote abortion. Therefore, if somebody, use, back to your analogy, wants to discuss abortion, they may do so. They may have to do it outside of Title X. Is it promoting abortion to simply discuss the fact that there is a procedure called an abortion, which may be an option available to a woman under certain circumstances? I would say, given the abuse found by the General Accounting Office back in 1982, I'm not asking about abuse. I'm just asking the very fact, excuse me, the very fact of telling a woman who has been raped and is pregnant that abortion is an option to her if she, if she, if she chooses it, giving the child up for adoption is another, carrying the child to term and keeping it is another, without directing it or promoting any one of those options, is that, is that something that you think is uh, promoting abortion simply by saying the option is available for an abortion? When 86.4 percent of pregnant women are referred for abortion, I think that that does promote abortion and that is outside the statute. So you're saying you believe that there are a lot of referrals for abortions, there are a lot of abortions taking place, and therefore even mentioning it as an option to a person should be prohibited? The, I think the program should be administered according to law and regulation, and there have been uh, abuses within the program, and the program should be administered in strict compliance And therefore, with because law. there's been abuse over here, a woman over here who's been raped should not be told that abortion is an option. A woman who has a, 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 fatal, a possibly fatal disease uh, if she carries the child. That is, isn't, in my opinion, it may be yours, but it's not in my opinion what Congress intended, and it's not in the opinion of Congressman Dingell, who authored the provision saying we as uh, Congress don't want abortion 
to be funded by the family planning With program. due respect, Mr. Waxman, I do not think if Mr. Dingell had not made his floor statement that Title X would have been enacted. Well, I don't disagree with that, and uh, I wasn't here at the time, but I, uh, I, I, Mr. Dingell was, and the Title X was enacted. But he did and, say those and, words, and the program and was enacted. And he has submitted a letter, and uh, I have the letter in front of me, which we've made part of the record, where he just uh, makes very clear, and I'll read it, in addition to relying on an incomplete legislative history, the department has also quoted passages from my floor statement out of actual and historical context to imply things that were not said and which may not be reasonably inferred. My statement was made in the opposition to the use of federal funds to support or encourage abortion as a form of birth control. The statement did not suggest, either expressly or implicitly, that family planning clinics should be prohibited from counseling pregnant women on any matter or referring them to appropriate facilities, nor did the statement support the imposition of record-keeping distinct uh, facility requirements, constraints on political activity, or the taking of a negative oath by clinics. The proposed regulations erroneously suggest that the statement somehow supported these goals. Those are the statements from Congressman Dingell, who, uh, who you're citing as the source for uh, the kind the of source, uh, regulations that have been The being source proposed. for the policy that the statute, the intent of Congress when Title X was enacted, that the program is not to promote, advocate, or encourage abortion. And I think that when you have abuses in a program and when there are problems, then it is very pr prudent for program managers to take the steps necessary to ensure strict compliance. Thank you very much. Mr. Nielsen? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Fox suggested in his testimony that family planning clinics encourage teens to involve their parents in decisions about using contraceptions. Do any of you agree with that or disagree with that statement? I think Dr. Fox, and I should mention that the region he is fr from has primarily a state-administered family planning program, and he is speaking from his personal knowledge in Alabama, and I have no qualms with that. When you look at the program, however, nationally, there is a great deal of a variety, and, and I don't think his comments hold true for the program across the board. Anyone else want to comment? Well, I would say that, oh, I would say that it's rather difficult nationally to involve parents in the, uh, in the whole process when they're forbidden to know uh, that their children are involved in it. I mean, it is impossible to have parental involvement unless you have parental notification first. You can't expect people to become involved in what they don't know about. The administration's proposed fun funding uh, Title X through the states directly. Do you agree or disagree with that pro approach? Dr. Glasso, do you agree, with that, agree or disagree? Uh, I'm not qualified to deal with that issue. I'd be happy to, we'd be happy to provide a written answer to Dr. that. Dr. Weed, do you have any concern, questions about that? I can only speak to the, uh, to the question in terms of my state where uh, we have a, a state task force on teenage pregnancy and I think we're well qualified and able to administer our own program and would like to do so. At the current time, we're prohibited to do that with any federal help because we have a parental consent and parental notification requirement. Do you know any other state that's making inroads on teenage pregnancy besides Utah? Um, not, not that they're making any uh, uh, inroads on a state level, no. Uh, would you say the country is losing the battle on teenage pregnancy? Yeah, we're, we're losing it. Um, the, uh, the rate of pregnancy, in spite of all our efforts and in spite of all the funding, has shown very little impact on the basis of, of federal You concur programs. with Mr. Schwartz's uh, suggestion that it increased uh, by 150 percent? Is that for, your... For unwed, unwed teens, that's correct. I think the point the chairman was making is the total sexual activity may stay the same, but if you have a smaller percentage who marry, that would increase the unwed uh, uh, marriage. That, that's the question he's trying to raise. Would you, could you refute that? Or I'd be, well, I'd, I'll try to clarify it. Sir, uh, the, I think the number of pregnancies and the number of births to married women who are under the age of 20 is relatively irrelevant to the success or failure of Title X because most of those births, if not all of them, are intended births. Uh, and if the number of young women under the age of 20 who are married is reduced, then naturally the number of babies they have and intend to have is reduced. The social problem, which we know under the label teenage pregnancy, really is the problem of unmarried teenagers becoming pregnant. The total number of unmarried teenagers who became pregnant was 
two and a half times as high in 1980 as it was in 1970. And very little of this was due to population but increase because the teen population how, peaked in 1976. How much of that would have been reduced if some of those, if the marriage rate had stayed the same? It would have been, it still would have made would no difference a, at all that I can see, sir. Still would have been a large increase. Would have made no difference at all if the okay. marriage rate had stayed the same. Doctor, the only we, thing the marriage rate does is change the relative balance, balance between marital births and, un, and out, of, out of wedlock births among teenagers. Dr. Weed, uh, you mentioned on page four, demonstration programs indicate it's possible to aid in the AIDS crisis. Could you give an example of that? Let me, delay, uh, delay sexual involvement and therefore uh, uh, help uh, cut down the amount of AIDS? A couple of programs come to mind. We're evaluating two of them. Um, one of which has demonstrated in, in one of the sites a reduction from 147 pregnancies in the school to two years later 20 pregnancies and we don't find that kind of reduction in Title 20 kind of program or Title 10 kind of program. Another illustration is from a pr project up in uh, Chicago. Uh, uh, 15 school districts are involved and we find huge shifts in kids' attitudes and values and beliefs about premarital sexual activity uh, and we're suspecting that we're going to see that transfer into behavior and a reduction in pregnancy there. Can you give any examples of your statement on page five saying something about the uh, parental involvement and parental factors of uh, improved situation whereas ignoring and dismissing and minimizing the roles of parents uh, has caused problems? There's a project recently reported funded uh, through Title 20 and, and also uh, additional support was given by the Ford Foundation. They looked at the repeat pregnancy rate for girls who had had a child out of wedlock. They were trying to reduce the repeat pregnancy rate in the situation where the, where the parents were directly and heavily involved, the repeat re pregnancy rate was one out of 15. In the control group, under the usual kind of approach, it was one out of four. So the, the difference was about 300% by involving parents in a significant and meaningful way. Now, I'm going to ask you and also Dr. Glasso the same question, but uh, you didn't have a chance to finish your statement. Five minutes is not enough time, and you, got, you didn't get to page six, but you say something about our recommendation would be to reassign one-third portion of the Title X funds currently used for teenage clients and establish a new and different program in line with the criteria listed, which has promise for solving the problem. You have a second recommendation to evaluate more systematically, more objectively from independent sources, the thrust of the new but also the existing Title X programs that operate in, under these untested assumptions. What would you recommend we do with the present legislation proposed by either, both by number one, the administration, number two, by um, Waxman and uh, Madigan. What would you do about those two pieces of legislation? And we've not seen the, granted we have not seen the details of the federal, but uh, of the administrations, but what would, you, what would your recommendations be in those two? I'd have to say that uh, whatever Title X may do for other segments of the population, what it does not do is contribute to the net solution of teenage pregnancy. If, if we knew then what we know now about teenage pregnancy, we would never assume that Title X would be a solution teenage, to the pregnancy problem. And we can't go another 15 years assuming that we have a solution. Therefore, with that uh, experience now behind us, we ought to be able to move ahead in a different direction. Building in these kinds of criteria that I've suggested are going to make a difference in reducing teenage pregnancy rates. Let me ask you a blunt question. Uh, would, you would you recommend abolishing Title X entirely? No. I think I there are parts of Title X that, that make a contribution. But we, ha we can't take it as a lump sum and ignore those parts that are failing so drastically. Mr. Schwartz, uh, you sort of indicated that if you cut the funding, you'll also cut the teenage pregnancy. The logical conclusion is if you eliminate the funding, you'll, you'll uh, close to eliminating the teenage pregnancy. You're yes, not, that, has to be, that has to be weighed, of course, against uh, other possible objectives of the Title X program. The only objective that I have made the subject of my scholarly investigations has been the impact of Title X on teen pregnancy, and it has been disastrous. Uh, I think that... Uh, uh, the second alternative which I recommended, namely disqualifying unmarried minors from uh, eligibility for contraceptive services through Title X, would uh, significantly improve the situation with respect to out-of-wedlock teen pregnancy. I also think that reducing the funding by one-third uh, to, uh, uh, to note the fact that uh, uh, family planning clinics would be losing a large part of their clientele would probably also be a healthy thing to do. Uh, Dr. Glasso, Dr. Fox testified availability of family planning actually reduces the incidence of both pregnancy and abortion among teenagers. Would you comment on his statement? Our basic problem with the Title X program as it's currently being administered is that it promotes abortion. Uh, you're suggesting just the opposite. It promotes abortion and increases pregnancy. Are you, suggest, are, are you putting... 
we're not making a statement about the increases in pregnancies. We're, since we're focusing on the abortion, abortion issue, our concern is the fact that it's uh, allowing organizations to get federal funds to promote abortion contrary to the original intent of the legislation. Let me and ask it's the question I asked Dr. Weed. Would you, if, if you had the power, would you abolish Title X entirely? There are many systemic problems with Title X as it's currently set up. The, the chairman's proposed legislation would make that worse. Um, we oppose the proposals that I've, I've outlined in you my written not, testimony. You indicate you oppose the school-based clinics primarily, and right, you the also oppose the use of the uh, RU486. Right, any funds to uh, promote to, the, to the study research, or the funding on RU486 and similar abortion-causing drugs and devices. Now, as far as Title X is concerned, those are larger, the larger issues are in the courts, and uh, in the best possible situation, if Title X is, is returned to its original uh, program, a family planning program where it does not promote abortion, we'd be hands off because we are interested in uh, the abortion issue. I have two more questions, Mr. Chairman, if, if I may. I'd like to ask Mrs. Gasper, uh, you were formerly Deputy Assistant Secretary for Population Affairs. I understand there's a curriculum produced by Dover, New Hampshire Clinic, funded with Title X grant, which you have concerns about. Um, it talks about the evaluation and review of Title X project. Can you speculate how this curriculum might be consistent or inconsistent with Title X? The uh, Dover, New Hampshire clinic or curriculum is inconsistent with Title X and it's inconsistent in, in many aspects. Uh, the why, did it, why did it receive Title X funds in that case? That's a very good question, sir, but it's not the, I would say it's an example of the problems with the program where groups are receiving funds to do things which are not consistent with statute. Uh, how about sex education programs? Are they consistent with Title X objectives? It depends on the sex education program. Uh, Title X does fund sex education. But weren't you, weren't you dismissed from your job because you refused to fund some of those sex education programs? I was, uh, refused, I was fired because I refused to fund two Planned Parenthood uh, grantees for training programs. And I did so because to fund them would have been unlawful and inappropriate, as well as contrary to my moral convictions. But the primary thing was it was unlawful, and I was not even permitted to administer the department's rules to see if the programs were in compliance. I was told I could not look at the grants in order to fund without looking at them. Did you seek or obtain any, any help when you were fired? Uh, from the uh, Government Employees Union or any, uh, any groups of that nature. The reason I ask the question is because I serve on another committee where some 33 people, 33 people lost their jobs because they went from a specific categorical programs to a grant program, block grant program, and therefore there's no need for the administrators. As I understand the administration's program, they're going to need fewer administrators in the federal level. We will have to then reduce those jobs and when that was in the ed field of ed education, there was a furor over it that lasted for three years. You didn't seek that kind of uh, well, sir, recrimination or... or uh, as you know, there is a fellow by the name of Ernie Fitzgerald who uh, was responsible for the whistleblower legislation that protects federal bureaucrats from uh, inappropriate firings. Uh, Fitzgerald but you was... you didn't seek a remedy on that. I bit. was not eligible for remedy. I was a political appointee and served totally at the discretion of the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. And therefore, I, I did seek uh, whistleblower protection. I was, could not get whistleblower protection because I was a political appointee. That goes beyond the scope of this hearing, and I apologize for bringing it in. But it, what, it was intriguing to me that uh, some employees seem to be able to hang on to things uh, when in the, when the discretion of their boss, they, they're no longer needed or they're not going along, along with the regulations in there as they see them, but you apparently were not. I just I was about not that. eligible because I was Appreciate a political. Appreciate that clarification. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You were fired because you were given a direct orders by your superiors to do something which you didn't want to do and therefore fired for insubordination. I was fired because I refused to fund, use taxpayer dollars to fund grantees that, it w that the funding of which would have been unlawful and inappropriate. That was and your, in that was your no. view, but your superiors had a different view of and ordered you to sign some papers. You felt it was unlawful. They felt it was lawful. 
they told you to sign the papers. You said you wouldn't. Okay. Before. I, on June, the, the grant expired at the end of June. I was ordered four or five times to fund the grants. I had requested permission to review the grants, review, to take appropriate administrative action if needed. I was denied permission to review. I was ordered to fund. I told my superiors the reasons why I felt it was unlawful to fund and explained to them that if they wanted the grants funded, they could sign, the secretary could sign, the assistant secretary could sign, or two members of my staff could sign. Okay. I was, if I may finish the story leading up to my, my well, I'll tell you, I, the I, grants I, expired. I really, the general do it very briefly because I'll do it very briefly. Basically, what you're saying is you didn't think you should do what they wanted you to do. I felt they it was unlawful. You should have, and they fired you. And I, they fired me after the grants had expired. I sought general counsel advice on whether it was appropriate for me to fund or not. I was told by the general counsel of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services that it was inappropriate to fund. Okay. Um, and I did not Mr. fund. Mr. Uh, Glasso, did, oh. did you, um, I think Mr. I'm sorry, I'm not sure whether it was Mr. Schwartz or Dr. Weed said that he didn't think Title X ought to be funding contraceptives, no, it was Mr. Schwartz, contraceptives for teenagers that were unmarried. Do you agree with that, that Title X should not be permitted to provide a contraception for teenagers that were not married? My organization takes no position on contraception at all. That's not your issue. Okay. Uh, I wanted to clarify a point on our legislation about school-based clinics and abortion-inducing drugs. Current law neither requires nor prohibits school-based clinics or these drugs. It's just not, the current law doesn't say one way or the other about it. The department has said that they don't intend to start these programs. Our bill does not require or prohibit such clinics or such drugs. We just don't do anything other than what current law now provides. Uh, I just want that to be clear to you. You, I suppose, would like to have it prohibited. So you would like to see a change in current law to prohibit school-based clinics or prohibit the department from deciding to fund uh, uh, drugs that are abortion-inducing. But my legislation doesn't require them to do it. And they don't say they, they seem to be have, uh, be unwilling and have no intention to do that sort of thing. Uh, they're not uh, inclined to do it. We don't tell them to do it. We just don't go further and say that they shouldn't do it. We don't change current law in that respect. Is that your understanding? The, the legislation that you proposed would allow the f the funding to go forward if the department made the decision to do it. it current that law correct? allows that. Current law allows them to use fundings for contraceptive purposes if they chose to or something that is not contraceptive as you see it. Uh, if we give them more money to do contraceptive research, if they decided contraceptive research was this uh, RU486, if they decided just because they had more money they wanted to do that, they could do it, but we don't direct them to do that. This would be a new initiative that would encourage the department to move into these areas. And in particular, it's important to keep in mind the companion bill on the Senate side, which is promoting not only the research but the marketing and uh, I, I want you to understand and I'm not sure what the Senate bill provides but our bill does not provide anything about marketing our bill does not provide it promoting this drug or this kind of research it is it is uh, clearly a statement that there ought to be more research on contraception and it leaves current law in place for the department to decide what uh, contraceptive uh, research they want to do now uh, Mr. Schwartz, you Sorry. said a statement that I, I just, uh, puzzled me. Do you believe that current law forbids parents to know that their children, teenagers, are in a clinic? It forbids client personnel from notifying the parents if the child does not first initiate that well, that's, contact. That's correct, but that's different than your statement a while ago. It, you, parents are forbidden to know. As that parents fact, are forbidden to know if their child doesn't, uh, doesn't want them to know. As a matter of fact, I authored the provision in the law that said that the clinics should encourage the family involvement and to encourage the teenagers to have their parents brought in to, into these discussions, uh, but didn't mandate it because it, in every circumstance, in my view, it shouldn't be mandated. Oh, Mr. Waxman, this program that's funded by Title X actively discourages family involvement and says basically that we don't, that the parents should not be involved. 
Well, I haven't seen that, so why don't you submit it to us and I'll let me be, look I'll at it. I'll be glad to, and, uh, to do so. If it's inconsistent with the idea of encouraging family participation, I would then say I that certainly it is. wouldn't. Uh, and, Mr. Want. Chairman, since your comment was directed to me, I, uh, we simply have a disagreement of opinion, I think. I cannot imagine how families can be involved if there are circumstances under which their children would be enrolled in these programs and they wouldn't be, they wouldn't allow, be allowed to know about it. You can't imagine, and there are such circumstances. You can't imagine how parents can be involved if the, if the, if the, if the teenage uh, person has the right to not bring them in. No, I'm, I, I cannot imagine how parents can be involved if their child does not bring them in. You know, and uh, I can. I, I, in other words, I don't have in other words, the thrust of the statement. the thrust of the language which you added to the to the uh, uh, to the program in 1981 or 1980, what it, whenever it was, was uh, uh, really had no effect. Well, what uh, you're because saying it still is left the ability of parents to know whether the government was giving the children for whom they are legally responsible drugs which might be dangerous to their health in the hands of a child who is an immature minor. The difference we have is whether that uh, whether the the uh, teenager whether the government should be, agent in, hmm? whether the teenager should be encouraged by the clinic to have the family involved in these discussions and decisions and uh, they are encouraged, supposed to encourage that. But the question is whether you mandate it under every circumstance, and you're correct that we do not mandate it. If uh, after discussing it with a teenager, the teenager feels for all sorts of different reasons, like parents may be the problem, there may be sexual abuse of the child, there may be an absolute disregard by the parents, and other circumstances that uh, we could, we could uh, easily imagine. Then under those circumstances, it is not required by law that the parents be notified and brought in. Which and means the parents extent, do not have a right to know whether the government right. is putting drugs the into the bodies of their children, right. but, but the government officially the, the is on parents, record as encouraging the their involvement have, in this process. Me, the okay. parents do not have the right, an absolute right superseding all other rights. Mr. Waxman, no. there is a, if I may, on, kind of on this line, in getting parents out, I mean, not addressing the, you know, what we should do or should not do dur with parents, but there is a problem in the actual operation, the Title X program, that I, it may behoove Congress to address. And let me give you an example. Um, there are family planning clinics that are out across the country. They do see services, uh, provide services confidentially to minors. Uh, in talking to clinic personnel, clinic personnel have expressed concern that pimps are arranging uh, access to Title X services for minor children so they can go out on the streets and not get pregnant. If you have evidence of this, I'd like to receive it. We're going to leave the record open. Well, I, I, we have to I end. mean, I don't have hard, I mean, no, I just I don't have want conversations. To, I, 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 we, we really must go on. We have other witnesses uh, to hear from. If you have something on this, submit it to us in writing. We'll put it in the record. If you have evidence of pimps doing something like that, I want to see that evidence. I have because certainly we wouldn't want that uh, to be prevented. I have recommended that you, that you modify Title X so that there has to be reporting to the local child protective agency uh, so that that can be followed up. I'd be interested in seeing that. Uh, and I may even end up agreeing with you. I'd like to see it. Mr. Nielsen, do you have anything yes, further? I have one question, on. one basic question. It seems to me, and I hope this isn't uh, misinterpreted, seems to me that if a woman becomes pregnant, she's already made the decision. What role, why should she go to a family planning unit and, uh, under those circumstances? She's already pregnant. Has she already made the decision to have the baby or to at least to uh, become pregnant? And, uh, and if so, why does, she need to be to, why does she need to be involved in family planning? clinic in the first place. Is this directed to anyone, sir? Anyone that likes to? Well, I'll volunteer to start out. Trial, trial um, balloons. It is a woman who is pregnant might find herself at a family planning clinic because she didn't know she was pregnant before she came into the family planning clinic. She might okay, be, that's her one. pregnancy might be diagnosed there. At that point, she does not need the services of a family planning clinic. She needs the services of someone who can manage her pregnancy. And the new regulations uh, uh, require that Title X recipients refer her to such agencies. Uh, just as if they found by accident that she had uh, uh, a heart problem, they would not try to diagnose or treat that heart problem. They would refer her to someone who could competently do it. So you would say she doesn't need to be in a family planning, planning clinic if she's pregnant? Well, if she's or pregnant, if, she, if, she's, if, if, she if pregnancy becomes, is if discovered, she ought to be referred somewhere else because she's no longer in the, in the realm of needing family planning services. Okay. Anyone else like to comment on that? Dr. Glasso, do you have any comment? Dr. Wien? All right. Okay. Uh, with, I, didn't, I have several more uh, questions I'd like to submit for the record, but I appreciate your coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. We will uh, provide for an opportunity for uh, members to submit questions in writing and get 
get the responses to them for the record. I'd like to leave the record open for uh, questions to all three panels and the next two and for other members to make statements. So I just want to do this for the record so it will be clear that we have unanimous consent for that purpose. M Mr. Waxman, Thank you. there is an, yes. another area where we have agreement and that is in your proposal in your bill for in improved data collection. Good. And I can speak as a former DASPA that I very much supported when I was the DASPA and attempted to improve the data collection because we do need to know whether or not Title X works. I'm reasonably confident the current DASPA supports your uh, data collection, but there's some bureaucratic difficulties. Uh, well, we'd be happy to discuss those further so, with you and um, look for other areas of agreement as we work uh, through on this problem and the legislation that's before one, us. One clarification, Mr. Chairman, yes. quickly. Um, if you think that HHS already has the authority for two of these new initiatives that are in your legislation, uh, we would assume that you would not object to amendments saying that the provisions don't uh, grant any more authority there. Don't grant any any new authority, additional authority. In other words, if, if the well, I, I'd, Title I'd, be, I'd be receptive to that. Let's look at it uh, because we're not planning to change the law in that regard. And uh, we should, if that's our intent, we should uh, have that clear so you don't believe that we're, we're, not, we're changing present law. That, uh, thank you very much. We've got other witnesses, but we're going to break now until 2 o'clock and we'll return to this room and, and complete the testimony. While the House Energy Subcommittee on Health recesses, we'd like to remind you to tune to our schedule update at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 Pacific, for information on whether this hearing will re-air in its entirety in our overnight schedule.